ready? Magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. Good morning to everyone. The hearing of the Committee on Public Information and Mass Media regarding fake news is now called to order. This is a resumption of our hearing. This is the third and hopefully last hearing that we will have on this subject. I will be very candid with you. Naghalo-halo ng emosyon dito sa ating hearing na to na lumalim pa minsan ng alitan uh, mula sa iba't ibang kampo. Pero sa tingin ko naman, marami tayong natutunan, maraming mga hugot na lumabas dito, pero dapat natin balikan, bakit ba tayo nagkakaroon ng hearing na ganito? Uh, ito'y para magkaroon tayo ng impormasyon na masasandalan natin, na mapapaniwalaan natin na totoo. Alam mo, sa ating konstitusyon, The importance of communication in our constitution, the importance of communication, is recognized as a tool for nation building. Therefore, it is important for our countrymen to be able to determine through the proper channels and through truthful reporting what is really going on around them so that they can make informed decisions. Now, we will discuss the responsibility and accountability of bloggers and journalists alike, the effect of online platforms like Facebook, Google in shaping public opinion, the accountability of government officials such as myself for the use of resources in spreading information, na pag-usapan at na pagbigyan ang ilang bloggers makapagsalita sa huling hearing Unfortunately, we were unable to tackle the issue regarding the role of online platforms last time because some of our invited resource persons were at that time unavailable. Ano po ba yung fake news? First, we must make a distinction between facts and opinions. Yung sabi ng mga blogger ang sari-sari nilang kuro-kuro ay hindi pwedeng itawag na fake news. Ito ay opinion. Pangalawa, napag-alam natin nung huling hearing na may dalawang uri ng fake news, disinformation at misinformation. Ang ibig sabihin ng misinformation ay balita na salungat, pero ang pinagmulan nito ay hindi naman sinasadya. This is not intentional. When, it, when we say misinformation, we may have made a mistake with our facts, and then we take it upon ourselves if we are responsible enough to correct ourselves. Uh, meron namang misinformation that arises from ignorance that is um, unintentionally for, for, false. Ang disinformation naman ay maling balita na sadyang kinakalat para malin lang ang publiko. It is false information that is designed to mislead and purposely spread to convince others of an untruth. Paano ba napapalaganap ang misinformation at disinformation In today's digital age, social media is a necessary distribution mechanism for these campaigns. Ayon sa pag-aaral at report noong 2017 ng Global Over Overview, kaya napaka-importante nito ha, ang Pilipinas, pang-pito sa buong mundo sa pagdami ng bagong social media users kumpara sa bilang ng social media users nito noong 2016. 12 million ang bagong social media users sa Pilipinas noong 2017. Yan lang yung mga bago, hindi yung mga dat datihan na. Pang-anim ang Pilipinas sa buong mundo sa dami ng Facebook users. And I will ask you to verify these facts to our guests. Mayroong tumataginting na anim na pong milyong Facebook users sa Pilipinas noong 2017. Nangunguna or top notcher ang Pilipinas sa buong mundo sa time spent on social media. Siguro dahil wala tayong mapuntahan, kulang yung mga parks natin, siksikan yung mga lugar, wala tayong pera, yung pinakamura, social media. At naglalaan tayo ng apat na oras at labing pitong minuto kada araw sa paggamit ng social media tulad ng Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter, Instagram at kung ano-ano pa. Marami sa atin ang kumukuha ng balita mula rito. There are many studies on how information and communication technology has been used for disinformation. 
One observation that came out of the discussions was the proliferation of fake news. Uh, this was brought about by the collective efforts of experts in creating an architecture of disinformation, possibly designed for certain principles. Understanding this architecture of disinformation, its structure, could help us curtail it, if not totally eliminate or stop it. Our revised penal code of the Philippines, Article 154, prohibits, penalizes, and fines unlawful use of means of publication and unlawful utterances, including publishing or causing publication, any news or false news. So dati pa ito, criminalize na po ito sa ating bansa. Hindi po ito bago. Siguro ang ating hamon ay kung paano natin talaga masusure kung ito ba'y intentional, kung gaano ba ito kasama ang naidudulot sa ating mga mamamayan. Facebook says that they are not in the business of publishing news and they never claim to be a media outlet. Further, they are, they are a private entity. No one is compelled to join Facebook. On the other hand, it has also been argued that Facebook is a non-traditional media company. The fact of the matter is it has become one of the main sources of information for more Filipinos. It is so accessible because the app comes free with most cell phones. Perhaps it may be considered as a service imbued with public interest. Public interest is affected when social media is used to spread information among the citizenry. Public interest is also affected when social media is used as a weapon to silence dissent on either side. Pero paano natin mapipigilan ang paglaganap ng fake news upang hindi sumama ang ating marketplace of ideas? Nasa interes ng publiko na malaman kung ano ang katotohanan o kasinungalingan. Ang tanong, ang katotohanan ba ay nasusukat sa dami ng likes, hearts, o shares? O hindi ba dapat itaas natin ang diskurso ng pagbibigay ng impormasyon sa ating mga kababayan dahil sa pagdating rin ng panahon, lahat naman tayo may bebenepisyohan nito. An enlightened and informed citizenry. So before I start with questions to our resource speakers, I would like to acknowledge um, well, I would like to acknowledge our, since I don't have anyone else here, this is just a continuation of our hearing. Perhaps it's better if I ask our resource persons to introduce themselves, beginning with uh, Secretary Martin Andanar, then Secretary Harry Roque, uh, members of the government panel, and then the rest. Secretary Andanar. Good morning, Paul, Madam Chair. My name is Secretary Martin Andanar, and I represent the Presidential Communications of Operations Office. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Senator. I am Harry Roque, the uh, presidential spokesperson. However, I would like to emphasize that my appearance here is in my personal capacity because as spokesperson, I cannot speak um, outside of um, uh, what the president would want to announce to the public. So to remedy that, I'm here in my personal capacity. And hence, I'm just Harry Roque, not the presidential spokesperson. Mr. Roque, I think it will be very difficult to differentiate, especially when there are official questions that I think you can answer uh, based on uh, institutional memory or even what you've heard from the president. So maybe just make a distinction as you answer because you are now wearing two hats, sir. Okay, thank you, madam. I will do that. Okay. Thank you, sir. Ma'am. Good morning, uh, Madam Senator. I'm Attorney Marie Rafael Bonag of the Presidential Communications ASEC for um, Operations and Legislative Affairs. Good morning, Madam Chair. I am Chris Roman of the Office of the Chief Presidential Legal Counsel. Good morning, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Assistant Secretary Darren Salipsip of the Office of the Chief Presidential Legal Counsel. Good morning, Madam Chair. My name is Attorney June Guzman from the Office of the Chief Presidential Legal Counsel. 
Good morning, Madam Chair. I am Carlos Caliwara, Assistant Secretary for Legal Affairs and Consumer Protection and Legislative Officer of the ICT, Department of Information and Communication Technology. Sir, panalo kayo pinakamahabang title <laughs> dito. Good morning, Madam Chair. My name is Harold Clavite. I am the Director General of the Philippine Information Agency. Good morning, Madam Chair. I'm Attorney Christopher Hernandez from the NBI Cybercrime Division. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair. I'm Victor Lorenzo, ma'am. I'm with the Digital Forensic of the NBI. Good morning, Madam Chair. I am Attorney Roy Ibai from Smart Communications and PLDT. Good morning, Madam Chair. I'm Cheryl Ruth Soriano. I'm an Associate Professor at De La Salle University. Morning, Madam Chair. I am Attorney Rudolfo Larval of the KBP. Sir. Good morning, Madam Chair. I am Simon Milner. I am Vice President for Public Policy at Facebook uh, for this region. Good morning, Madam Chair. I'm Ms. Claire Davy, and I'm the Director of Community Engagement for Facebook in Asia Pacific. Morning, Madam Chair. I'm Inday Espina Verona. I'm a journalist, a blogger. I represent the Arts and Media Alliance, Lodi. Morning, Madam Chair. I'm Lee Shun. Uh, nice to see you again. I'm representing the public policy team from Google Asia Pacific. Okay. Uh, good morning. I'm Tres Reyes. I'm a senior editor editorial director of CNN Philippines. Good morning, ma'am. I'm Pia Ontiveros, Pagkalinawan, Chief Correspondent, CNN Philippines. Good morning, Madam Chair. I'm Chi Mario Gonzalez, Head of ABS-CBN News Standards and Practices. Good morning, Madam Chair. I am Dino Apolonio, General Manager of People's Television Network. Magandang umaga po. Rowena Paraan, um, ABS-CBN. I also handle Bayan Mo, Ipatrol Mo which includes um, among its advocacies uh, media and information literacy. Good morning, Madam Chair. I'm Armand Nokum of the Dean and King's Public Relations. Uh, we specialize in tri-media and online media news services. Thank you once again. Welcome to our public hearing. And I thank you once again for your presence. Some of you here have been uh, um, repeat uh, resource persons, and I thank you for your patience. I thank you also for members of the government panel for being here in spite of your busy schedules. And of course, to our foreign guests, welcome to the Philippines. I hope this will be a good uh, initiation for you for being here, or maybe you've been here several times, but we'd also like to convey the seriousness of this matter, and we appreciate your inputs and your presence here today. Okay, let me begin. Um, perhaps we can give this uh, time now, if there's anybody here from Facebook or Google who would have a presentation to make, because I think this is what we've been wanting to hear from the onset of our hearings. Madam Chair, um, with your indulgence, and the problem is I have an 11 o'clock press briefing in Malacanang, so may I be given um, uh, at least three minutes to make my preliminary statement because um, unfortunately the Monday, Tuesday, Thursday's press briefing is about the only regular uh, official function that I, I discharge in the palace, so if I may be allowed to um, just say for about three minutes and possibly some questions. Of course, sir, but I think that you can, you can also conduct your press conference here. We already have satellites that can uh, <laughs> send out that information. And I'm sure whatever you'll say here is also as interesting as whatever you might have to discuss in your press briefing. But please, go ahead. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, for, um, for the opportunity. You know, as I said, I'm here in my personal capacity. Um, although I think as a matter of record, the President has not initiated any legal action as far as freedom of expression is concerned. He's a very big supporter of press freedom. In the 30 years that he has um, um, served government, he has not filed a single libel case, and he welcomes uh, criticism as part of, really, the realm of politics. However, um, I do have my personal uh, uh, positions on the um, bill that we are discussing today. 
I do so as an advocate of freedom of expression. I have brought a, uh, the matter of criminal libel in the Philippines to the UN Human Rights Council, and we have gotten a view that criminal libel in the Philippines is contrary to freedom of expression. We have also brought a case before the Philippines challenging the uh, cyber libel law, and we had a partial victory you know, where the takedown provision of the cyber libel was declared as unconstitutional by the su Supreme Court. Now, my view on, um, on uh, fake news, let me begin by stating the, what already appears in jurisprudence. No? To begin with, the Constitution says there should be no law abridging freedom of expression. Any law which will criminalize um, fake news will obviously be in violation of this prescription because it is a law that would abridge freedom of expression. Now, uh, the basis, of course, for the constitutional provision is because we have a firm commitment not only to freedom of expression but also to the free marketplace of ideas. And here, perhaps, it is a propose to state that in the leading case of New York Times versus Sullivan, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that fake news is not necessarily um, um, antithetical to freedom of expression. And let me quote, even a false statement may be deemed to make a valuable contribution to public debate since it brings about the clearer perception and livelier impression of the truth produced by its collision with error. Here, the emphasis is we must protect the free marketplace of ideas because ultimately the truth test for truth is the power of an idea to be accepted in the free marketplace of ideas. The assumption being people can discern the truth from what is false and there's in fact jurisprudence which states that sometimes the truth cannot be known without being told falsities no? because it is only in the face of falsities that we can tell what the truth is. But beyond this theoretical framework, and beyond the general prescription, I would say that um, any criminal law penalizing fake news would also suffer the infirmity of what is being called void for vagueness. Now, here we come to the issue of if we're going to penalize fake news, who will judge what is fake news and what is news? Because the current framework now, it's, it's the public that should be allowed to decide what is true from what is false, but if you make it criminal, then Certainly, a judge would have to sit in judgment and decide what is true and what is false, arrogating, therefore, unto itself and into the institution a matter that is better left to the public to judge for themselves. So, first, my objection as an advocate of freedom of expression is that it is literally um, void on its face for being content-based restriction. Now, if, if it is not void in its face, then at least according to jurisprudence, it enjoys the overwhelming presumption of unconstitutionality, and it is for the state to prove a clear and present danger you know, to sustain the validity of the state interest in prohibiting freedom of expression. Now, unlike in Europe, where mere utterance, for instance, incitement to genocide is actionable, we do not adopt this view because we have adopted the American view that Maintaining the free marketplace of idea should prevail even as against property rights because, as I said, it's the cornerstone of our democratic system. So first, in my view, it enjoys the presumption of unconstitutionality. Second, it might be void for vagueness because we don't know what is meant by truth from what is false, and this is a very real issue. In the realm of international politics, for instance, the definition of who is a terrorist is oftentimes unanswered. Now, in the Middle East, if you ask the Israelis, they will have their own definition of who a terrorist is. If you ask an Arab, they will have a definition of who a terrorist is. Even today, you know, as, we file, as the DOJ has filed a petition to declare the NPA as a terrorist, the question is asked, who is a terrorist you know, for purposes of being declared a terrorist group? So this is the problem with, um, with um, criminalizing freedom of expression it could be declared as being void because we don't know what the definition of truth is and who will ultimately sit in judgment of what the truth is. My, my third point is I am not alone in advocating this view. In fact, we already have recognized views given by the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the Organization of American People's Rights, 
And they have all declared, and I quote, that general prohibitions on the dissemination of information based on vague and ambiguous ideas, including false news or non-objective information, are imprecise and incompatible with both national and international standards for valid containment of freedom of expression. Madam Chair, I have been a victim of fake news. It comes with the territory. And we can only hope that because people were given by God the ability to discern what is true and what is false, it is ultimately the public and the free marketplace of idea that should adjudge what the truth is and that should put ultimately the penalty on purveyors of fake news. Thank you, Madam. Thank you for your statement, Secretary Roque. In fact, I think we've been together many times in the past advocating for the freedom to express ourselves. We've been together in many um, advocacies uh, promoting freedom of expression. And I continue to believe in that, and I believe this is exactly why we are here today, is so that when we express our ideas, it's also based on fact. Now, we are not here uh, to create a new law exactly um, because there's already a revised penal code 154 criminalizing, in fact, misinformation or fake news. And it's very specific. That's why we're here to discuss that. Um, if you would like to discuss further, for example, um, something that pertains to this bill, the Civil Service and Government Reorganization Committee is the one that will handle that, not public information. On the other hand, I'm sure you believe to yourself that although there's a free market of ideas, we have to endeavor to always be responsible in ferreting out the truth. Do you agree, sir? Yes, I do, Madam. In fact, that's the second part of my uh, statement. And if you allow me, no, the um, proposed law um, singles out government employees no, for spreading fake news. No? That, to me, is additionally uh, possibly infringing on equal protection because we are, um, we are in effect, no, singling out government employees. What is the importance of regulating fake news? It's because we want to uphold the truth. If the objective is to uphold the truth, it does not matter if it is a legitimate journalist or a blogger that spreads false news. And that is why my position is that there is no basis for singling out that only government employees should have liability when they spread false news. On the contrary, the cause, as I say, is a natural commitment, a natural advocacy for the truth. If we are to enact a law, which I advise against, prohibiting and, and penalizing fake news, it should apply to all, not just to government employees. Thank you for your opinion, but I think um, I would like to correct you on this matter. First of all, it applies to all. With a revised penal code, it already applies to all. But I think that you agree. Government employees, such as us, government officials and employees, are held to a higher standard. There are certain things that we are liable for. For example, we need to be able to present our sal and an ordinary citizen is not. We can be charged with graft and corruption, with plunder. An ordinary citizen is not unless they connive with us. So there are certain things that are expected of us because we have waived uh, that certain right because we are serving the people and we have to be able to be transparent, to be held at a higher standard. In fact, even in our constitution, it was mentioned to me by one of your bloggers, as early as 1918, it says that um, uh, government officials cannot be onion skinned. Uh, we have to be able to subject ourselves to criticisms. On the other hand, I know what you are worried about. I am there too with you. I am not here to over-regulate. That's why we have this, so that we can, even when I was chairman of uh, an agency, I believed in self-regulation. But we need to be able to see also the extent of um, our responsibility to be able to express ourselves freely. When it already infringes on the rights of others uh, to be able to live a normal life, to be able to defend themselves, I think that we need to be able to stop. You know, a lot of uh, teenagers now, for example, when they go home, the bullying doesn't stop. And I'm not saying that, um, and th the case is, because social media is so pervasive. So we're just trying to put safeguards. Sir, we are not trying to take away anyone's rights here. As I've already mentioned, revised penal code is already there unless you will have your drive to repeal it. But again, 
um, Senate Bill 1680, please, I encourage you to attend the Civil Service and Government Re Reorganization hearing, and you're free to express uh, your dissent on this particular bill. And I thank you, sir. So we will may, now... May uh, I be allowed one last yeah, point, go ahead, madam? Sir. Well, much has been said about the fact that there is an existing revised penal code provision on fake news. I hasten to add there hasn't been any prosecution or conviction on that basis of, of that provision of the law. And maybe this is because this is the reason why it hasn't been challenged in court. Because before you can challenge a statute as being unconstitutional, you must have an actual case or controversy. The fact that it is for all intents and purposes fake law probably indicates the position on the part of the executive that one should not prosecute on the basis of a law that is or may be declared as being unconstitutional. On the point, again, of government officials, again, the requirement of equal uh, protection of the law is that the, the, the intent of the law or the purpose of the law must be germane to the legislation. Sir, what we are sir, upholding we will is go the truth. Back and forth with this. Yes, Your Honor, but what we are upholding is the truth and when you uphold the truth, it matters not whether you're private or you're public. Thank you, Madam. I agree. But then there are certain requirements of us as government officials that are not required of private individuals. What will you say? Are you saying now that private individuals should, should also submit salience? Should they also be um, punished for plunder in all these other cases because the law should be applied equally to all? Of course not. We have certain responsibilities. And even in the private sector, if you're a member of a, a corporate organization, there are also certain rights you waive as a commitment to that organization. But anyway, moving forward, again, you're welcome to attend that. And as I said, Mr. Roque, we've always been, most of the time, on the same side of the fence, correct? We are That's here true, Madam Chair. to defend the truth. Nandito tayo para dyan. At ito namang posisyon natin, hindi naman panghabang buhay. Eh. Ang inaalagaan natin dito ay ang kinabukasan rin na kung sino man ang nandyan, eh yung mga batas na nakakatulong talaga sa ating bansa ang manaig. Kaya tama kayo. Pagdating sa deliberasyon nitong Senate Bill 1680, sabihin ninyo na useless ang Revised Penal Code 154, siguro dapat pati yan, ma-repeal na rin. At ang 1680, huwag natin ituloy. Ang opinion nyo ay mahalaga. Hindi lamang dahil kayo ay spokesperson ng presidente, kundi dahil matagal na ninyong pinag-aaralan ng batas, kayo ay practitioner, kayo ay Pilipino. So, itutuloy po natin ang pagdinig na yan, pero sa ngayon siguro, uh, pagdamutan na natin ang opinion nitong mga ating mga, mga foreigners na uh -oh. alam naman natin ay sandali lamang dito, pero Madam malaki Chair, po ang responsibilidad uh -oh. din nila. Uh -oh. May I now ask to be excused because it's an 11 o'clock hearing and I checked earlier with the Malacanang Press Corps if they will mind if I do my press briefing here in the Senate, and they said yes because... Um, Apparently, they all have beats to meet, and unless I make my briefing in Malacanang, they will not have their stories, or the stories will be submitted by the Senate beat. <laughs> you know, Secretary Roque, you will be sorely missed if you're not there, so please, you are excused, and thank you for your thank presence here today. Thank you very much, today. Madam Chair. Thank you for your time and indulgence. Okay, moving on. Um, may we begin with uh, Facebook, perhaps? Thank you very much uh, again, um, Madam Chairman. Uh, so as I mentioned, my name is Simon Milner. I'm re I've uh, recently moved to this region, having worked at Facebook for six years. Uh, up until uh, two weeks ago, I was working in London and being responsible for uh, Facebook's public policy team covering the Middle East and Africa, as well as the UK and Ireland. Um, I was excited about the opportunity to come to this hearing so soon after beginning my role, because having talked with my colleagues in this region, including Ms. Devi, you're going to hear from shortly, I know that as a company we care about the Philippines, we care about its people, and we care about this issue. Um, and the fact that I've, I'm new to the Philippines does not mean that Facebook is new to the Philippines. And you're going to hear from Claire shortly about the work that she has been doing uh, and with our colleagues uh, with a range of partners here in the Philippines to address the issues of concern. Um, as uh, Senator Poe herself said, this is a complex phenomenon uh, and one where we are always trying to balance the how can we help people access accurate information how can we disrupt the purveyors of disinformation and false news without undermining freedom of expression? And that's why this is an issue which is more difficult, frankly, than other issues that we try to tackle, including things like bullying, harassment, 
terrorism and, and other problems. This is a more complex issue. It's one which is much more nuanced. And what we can be absolutely certain of is there is no silver bullet. There is no one solution uh, that will fix this problem. It is multifaceted. And it's definitely one in which we are deploying the four, what we call the four Ps. So our policies uh, address it, our products, and that's what I will mainly be talking about. Uh, we, we need a lot of people to address it, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, and then partnerships. So it's policies, products, people, and partnerships it is our multi-pronged approach. If I could have the next slide, please. Um, we're very keen to build an informed community on Facebook. We want to. We know that that's an important responsibility that we have. But there are some people who want to use our, our, our platform to do the opposite, to actually ensure that people are not well informed, to, to sow division uh, within societies, including here in the Philippines. And so what we have is a four-pronged approach uh, that are laid out here to try to do this. First of all, we're about stopping bad actors from using our service. This is not about your least favorite actor in Hollywood. This, this is a technical term that's used within our industry to talk about people who are malicious, people who want to use services like Facebook, and we're going to hear from uh, Google shortly, use online services to, for, uh, with ill intent for, for criminal reasons often, we call them bad actors. So we want to stop those bad actors using our service, and often those people will use our service with fake accounts. Uh, so I'm, we're happy to answer more questions and explain more about what we're doing to address the problem of fake accounts, hacked accounts, issues around account security on our service. The second area of work is to disrupt economic incentives. Much false news and misinformation is not political in nature, but actually economic. It's people who are trying to use salacious and sensational headlines to get people to click on those, get them off Facebook, and into an, a, a low quality environment where there's lots of what we would call spammy advertising uh, to encourage people to click on those so that person can make money. Uh, another phrase you'll have heard is clickbait. Um, that kind of content is actually economically driven uh, and what we are doing in a number of ways and we're again happy to explain more about this is to disrupt those economic incentives. And the third area is newsfeed. So the most important product that, that we think is at play here is our newsfeed product. One of the reasons why you're right, Filipinas use Facebook for more, in more time during the day, I've already seen, is because of the traffic. Uh, so people, when they're sitting in the traffic here in Manila, uh, maybe the uh, president spokesperson will be doing the same shortly. Um, if you've got a couple of hours on a journey, what do you do? You go on to your so favorite social media app, uh, we're very pleased that six, for 66 million Filipinas, that's Facebook, um, and, they, and therefore people do use Newsfeed a lot. One of the things we've done a lot of work on is to think about how we rank content on Newsfeed to ensure that people see are much more likely to see the kind of high quality content early on in their newsfeed and that that's the content that they're interacting with. Both public content but also content from their friends and family. So we've done a lot of work around newsfeed ranking. I'm now going to turn to my colleague Ms. Devi to talk to you about the work we're doing with communities and partners to try and empower people to address this problem. Thank you Simon and Madam Chair it is good to see you again and thank you for having us. Um, for those that don't know me, I've been working in the Philippines for 10 years. Uh, initially when I started working here, I was working on digital literacy, traveling to barangays and setting up centers, and that was just about teaching people how to physically use technology. And what I saw is that Filipinos have a natural affinity and amazing use of it. What I see since I moved to Facebook two and a half years ago is that digital literacy has evolved, and now we have to not just teach people how to use the technology, but to understand what they see. My, my whole role is around local partnerships and empowering communities, so I want to take you very quickly through some of the things we've been working on for the last two and a half years. If I can have the next slide. First of all, at a broad reach, working on public education. So using the reach of our tools to get information out there. Starting in 2016 with the launch of our Safety and Bullying Prevention Hub with resources for students, teachers and parents. Then last year we saw the emergence of false news and globally, including in the Philippines, we released tips that you could see across the top of our news feed for spotting false news online. This was viewed more than 30 million times alone in the Philippines. 
What we heard, though, from our partners is that while this was good, it needed local and it needed nuance. So we worked with a local designer and just yesterday we released into the news feed the first of these six tips designed here for identifying false news. And in the first 24 hours with the first one out, we've already had more than half a million views of those tips and largely positive comments with people wanting more information about how they can do this. I can have the next slide, please. The next area that we want to work on is with media. So understanding that having a, a strong news ecosystem is important. We've been working with many journalists, first of all on journalist safety. So our team researched, we went from Cebu to Manila to Davao to speak directly to journalists about their concerns. And from that research we have made changes to the product that have been rolled out internationally, including updates to our harassment policies, and that came directly from hearing from journalists here in the Philippines. Secondly, we see an opportunity as Facebook to bring together people from the media across the region, and last year we launched our news literacy working group with representatives from the Philippines, and we had them come together to work with us on the future of news. That group will be reconvening in April in Australia this month and we continue to work with them. This is, this is an ongoing process and we need to hear from our partners. If I can have the next slide. Because we want to go further than just our products and our policies, we see in the 20th, 21st century learning the importance of equipping our students and of course the teachers with the ability to think critically. With all this information that is coming to you, how do you understand what you're seeing online? How do you distinguish between what is true, what is false, but also the nuance of opinion and perception? We also added to this something that I care very deeply about, which is empathy. So even if you look at all the information and you understand the source and where it's coming from, what will be the impact of you sharing that? What is your responsibility in the Filipino community to create a positive social space? We're working with Globe Telecom, who have an amazing program that they've been running for the last two years that's reached more than 40,000 students, and we added an extra module to their outreach specifically on critical thinking and empathy that we piloted and is now available to teachers. We've also been doing a much more in-depth pilot with Mano Amiga, a small non-for-profit school, which was a five-week intensive program with years seven and eight to understand how we could match these skills into the learning objectives of teachers and build it into the values education that the Philippines values so highly. We've taken that and we're now working with DepEd to understand how we can best ensure that these critical skills get maximum reach to students and teachers. If I can have the next slide. And then finally, I want to talk about what we're doing in 2018. I was here again four weeks ago, again connecting with various partners to understand what do we do next. And what we heard is that there is this need for this to be built into as many of our outreach and programs as possible. So we've been partnering with DTI on training for women entrepreneurs and small businesses. And then DICT will be assisting us uh, to get education around safety, critical thinking, out to the 2,400 centres that they now have around the Philippines and we're working with them on the best possible way to get that information out there. We also heard very loudly that there was a concern for, for, for Filipinos living overseas. So working with OA, we're looking at creating a localised video in English, Tagalog, Visaya and various local dialects that they will be able to see before they leave the Philippines to understand the positive side of social media and also how to discern what they see. And finally, in January this year, I ran the first trial. I provided training to an NGO based in Singapore, where I live, that outreaches with business education to Filipino foreign workers. And we ran a session on safety and news literacy. And we're taking that as a model and looking for other nonprofits right around the world and embassies that work with foreign workers to ensure that this education can get out as far as possible. So I just want to finish by saying this is something that we have Facebook and me personally care very deeply about and we do this always with partners. So we're open to hearing and understanding where we can work with people on this issue. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Ms. Ms. Claire. You mentioned there are six tips that you publish in your uh, page to be able to guide our netizens and be able to em em empower them and figure out which one is fake news and which one is real. Can you, can you mention those six steps? 
Okay, so some of the tips that we look at there, the first one that we released was often that false news will have large grand claims in the headlines. Um, we also encourage people to look back and see what the original source of the story is. So look for other people that have shared the story. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, we also look, look at the URL. So often it may have a false or misleading URL that people see when they first get. Um, okay, okay, that's a little bit technical. Explain, okay. I mean, this is for the benefit yeah. of our listeners. Okay, how will an ordinary citizen determine if a URL is legitimate or not? Absolutely. Thank you for pulling me up on that. With a URL, often there is a fake or a, a version of a popular site that you see. So we call out in the tip an example of one um, and we encourage them to look closely in the top of your browser what the URL is or the link that you click on. Okay. Can you show us an example there? Uh, for example, like a URL of like a CNN or whatever, but it, instead of like Al Jazeera, they'll say Al Jazeera yeah. Network or Al Jazeera TV, but not necessarily. That's correct, with a dash or it goes through to something else. Um, the example we used in the tip to really hit home was notveryreliablenews.org. Um, because we really Not wanted to, very <laughs> no, that's we really wanted to emphasize and get people's attention. Um, but I would be happy for anyone's interested to share the full six tips and the illustrations that we've got after the hearing. Okay, like give me another tip in terms of finding fake news. Yes. Um, so we're also looking at the in the headlines. Often there is extensive exclamations or claims. So whereas standard news sites will often have a very clear, concise headline More about sober. what the news is, but. Um, have you employed this yourself? I mean, if you see that, what action do you take in Facebook? I mean, I mean, it's clearly um, a dubious URL. Do you, do you block it? What do you do? Absolutely. Funnily enough, I have a personal story on this because my husband uh, would often sit next to me on the couch and say, have you heard this? And I have now trained him that he will start saying, oh, hold on, I'm just checking what this is. No, it's all right, I'm not going to share that story with you. Um, so with these things, I think as each person learns and as each of the students we work with learn, they become an advocate. As we worked with Mano Omega School, one of the questions that we got from the students was, how do we bring this subject up with our parents and teachers? Because often we see them looking at these things and getting confused. So again, having very clear tips for them about headlines, about looking at sources, about looking at how many people have reported the news, the dates, are things that we see works. No, 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 I, I understand, but does this go against your policy, let's say, in curtailing, um, not to curtail freedom of expression, meaning if it's clearly a fake news site, do you have a directive uh, from your corporate uh, leadership to take it down, to block it, or do you just allow it but your stance would be to educate the public to be able to discriminate. That's a, an excellent question because it gets to the heart of the challenge here. Uh, we do not think it's right for Facebook to be the arbiter of truth. And uh, we do not have a policy that says you can only post things on Facebook which are true. Um, because actually you imagine how difficult it would be for us to discern that and to decide it. However, uh, what we do encourage people to do is also to let us know if they see something that they believe is false news, you can report it to us. It doesn't mean that that's then against our terms, but what we then will use is use as a, as a signal that this is the kind of content that we want to, re we want to dis uh, reduce its distribution, push it down the news feed, mean it gets l seen less. And also, once w one of the things we've also done is partner uh, with third-party fact-checkers to also help us do that. So it's not to determine content that should be necessarily taken down, but it is about content that we should get lower distribution because it's, it's, less good, it's, it's poor quality content on our platform. Now, this is difficult. It's a very difficult area because I know in talking with policymakers elsewhere, their view is, well, why don't you just take it down? Uh, and actually, when, when we say to them, how often have you seen a report in a mainstream uh, publication, uh, including perhaps some of the ones around this table, which you believe is wrong? Do you think that, therefore, we should be taking that down because you tell us that's wrong? So in our view, um, that's a, a, a not the, the right um, judgment for a platform like ours to be taking, however uncomfortable that might be. But if we get enough signal, that both from the users of our platform, uh, from our third-party fact-checking partners, uh, then we can, as I say, uh, impact the distribution of that content, meaning it's less likely to be seen by as many people. 
Okay, sir. Actually, there's a report by a certain Jonathan Ong and Jason Cabanes uh, on paid troll networks being professionally operated by PR executives in our country and in many other countries. I mean, we've heard about Russian actors and, and you made a presentation, you said you'd be happy to expound on it. Um, they're primarily deployed through Facebook in an orchestrated way. Now, they are using fake identities and seeding messages in established FB groups. Can you tell us, I know that this is a, a very difficult thing that you have to balance, but what efforts are you exerting, at least uh, humanly possible, without necessarily curtailing any particular rights and freedom of expression, to clean up this environment and protect users also from such disinformation? Can, can, you, can you tell us? Absolutely, and, and to be clear, that's a, a fake account is against Facebook's terms. We do not allow people to have an account on Facebook where they are not, uh, which is inauthentic. And so, irrespective of whether that inauthentic or fake account is being used to spread fake news, we can act on it, and we do, and we do that. And some of that is about is based on. Do you want to ask another question before I complete, or I look, you you wanted to come in? Shall I complete the point, or? Y yes, yes, sir. Please, okay. please go ahead, and I'm going to okay. ask you to define right. a fake account for okay. us as Happy determined by Google. Uh, by Facebook, um, we. It's fine. By uh, Facebook and Google. <laughs> okay. Um, and so we, we use a combination of uh, factors. Um, it used to be that a lot of we, what we were based on was people telling us, so based on reports. But increasingly, we are using technology, including what we call machine learning. So we are looking at attributes associated with uh, fake accounts. Um, and that, uh, that could be the name on the account, but it's much more likely to be other kinds of behavior. Um, I hope you will understand why I don't want to talk in detail about that kind of behavior, because we don't want to tip off the bad actors about the kind of things we are looking for. But it's the kind of, because we can look for certain attributes and behaviors, means we can attack this at scale. So we not, don't just take down the odd account, we can take tens of thousands of fake accounts down. And this is a, an important priority for us because, as I say, it's often fake and inauthentic accounts which are being used to propagate um, uh, false news. So, sir, in a day, about how many, on average, do you take down? I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean in just one region or one country, but on average in, your, in the world. I, I understand why people would like us to have more numbers on this, and we will have more numbers soon. Um, you'll have but seen in the Philippines, do you see a pattern, sir? Uh, look, the Philippines is, um, it, it, in some, you know, although it, it's a very big market for us, you mentioned earlier, it's our sixth biggest market in terms of the number of people using so the service. So we're one of the biggest markets. One of the biggest markets. Okay. But the kinds of things that we see here are actually quite similar to what we see elsewhere. And uh, this is not a phenomenon which is unique to the Philippines. Um, so people who want to use our platform for ill, um, both state and non-state actors will use similar kinds of techniques, including creating fake accounts at scale. So the, I'm afraid I do not have a number that we can share with you um, about how many we've taken down in respect to the Philippines, but we are expecting to be able to share more information about this globally in the coming months. Actually, sir, there's one particular unique incident here where um, a, a, a blogger, for example, posted something against uh, a particular uh, public personality and her posts were taken down. But these were actually based on historical facts. I think I've mentioned this to you, uh, Ms. Claire, when we met. Um, you were able to restore that. Did, did you issue an apology or an explanation as to why you did that? So, so any time we get a report and we make a mistake, we do issue an apology. I think in each of the case, they're often very nuanced and understanding the background is important. Um, but it is something that, first of all, and I think any fake accounts that are reported to us, we take action on and we investigate. Where we make a mistake, where we get the content wrong, we issue an apology and we will restore the content. Okay. Um, the, me the media practitioners that we have here, I'm sure you have a lot of questions in mind. I, and if you'd like to ask it, you can address it to me. If you would like me, I can ask them for you um, to, our resource per to our resource persons here since anyway, they're here now. But perhaps while we have them here, I can ask Ms. Hontiveros. Okay. Or maybe Google, if you can. Okay. 
Uh, Google, you know what? I, th I think that you're the one of the most important tools that we have, and not just uh, for me personally, but my, my colleagues here. Uh, we usually Google certain information uh, to verify, but how are you able to filter also um, information that is posted on, on the web? Yeah, um, Madam Chair, thank you for having and, me. And also, how do you determine, for example, I, I type in a certain thing, um, uh, malnutrition in the Philippines. How is Google able to select what the top search is? Is this something that is paid for? Is this something based on the number of uh, uh, visits in that particular site? How do you determine the top posts? Yeah, so I think there are a few questions uh, noted in your questions, uh, Madam Chair. So thank you again for having me here today. I think uh, to answer your questions directly, um, you can't pay your way up to the top of the search rankings. You, you can, however, buy ads to show that you are... You uh, want sir, can you, can you speak closer to the mic? Okay, uh, can, can we begin again? Sure. I uh, mean, can we begin? Yeah, to answer your questions directly, you cannot pay your way up to the top of the search rankings in Google. All the, uh, the ranking in the, search in, in the search results are determined by an algorithm that takes into account various factors. One of the factors It's is determined by... An algorithm. An algorithm. Yeah. Okay, the algorithm is... And one of, the, uh, one of the factors that we take into account very, very seriously is the importance of trusted and high-quality content. So, okay. for instance, Could you, could you say content. that importance of content? Yes. Who determines that? So, for instance, we look at um, authority. Uh, newsrooms, for instance, are treated as uh, sources of authority, which is why you will see that we search for breaking news, for instance, in the Philippines. We will reflect, you see that the top search results will all be reflecting those on newsrooms. And I, and I think this is related to the question of how then do we ensure that the users are getting to the right content, as, as you put it, right? I think if you go back to our mission statement, which is to organize the world's information and make an university as uh, accessible and useful to users. That is, that, is, that is our remit to our users, right? And to that regard, it is important to us to continue to provide high quality and useful information to the users. So we do, we do that in a number of ways. Um, specifically with the newsrooms, we work very closely with them to make sure that they have an understanding of the latest technology. Okay, so you have a newsroom? Yes. Okay, your newsroom is composed of, do you have one in the Philippines? No, we work with newsrooms. You work with newsrooms? Yes. So you work with, let's say, ABS-CBN? Yes, indeed. How, do you, how exactly do you interact with them? Can, can you please lay out yep, the, sure. the procedure here? So um, I'll mention two main things that we work with them. So one thing is through our uh, Google News Lab, we work and with news publishers to help them produce high-quality journalistic content. So what do I mean by that? So a lot of times, uh, users are now demanding for interactive and, and uh, data-centric content in which they can better understand the issues they're they are looking for. So this, for instance, we ran workshops to help them understand how we can use technology to produce new stories that are uh, reflected using data, uh, using trends, to help users get better context of the issues they're looking for. We also teach um, um, through partnerships with newsrooms such as uh, from have my data here correctly. We recently ran one with Cebu Sunstar to train journalists and journalist students on the use of fact-checking tools so that they can also fact-check before they publish a, uh, a news article, which allows then users to be very clear, right, that, oh, this article has been fact-checked and these are accurate data, which they can trust. So ABS-CBN, do you have a representative that deals directly with um, search engines like Google? Are you aware of that, ma'am? Um, we have the, our digital uh, unit that um, deals with Google, but I'm not sure in what you know, extent and capacity. Uh, we are also um, working with Google about the Google News Lab. However, it's more on, um, more on how to use the Google site for certain things, but not that extensive. So I cannot really answer that. Mr. Lee. So do you know anybody from ABS that you work with, or GMA even, or Eagle Broadcasting? Yeah. I do not work directly with the newsrooms, but I'm happy to produce, uh, come back to you with information on exactly kind of workshops and the names of the journalists that we work with. Okay, sir. Now, I would like you to either verify or dispel this. So you're telling me that it's not necessarily something you can pay your way 
through to the top. Okay, you're, you're saying that. It will be based on an algorithm, maybe based on the number of searches and the credibility of the site. Um, but you have a person determining this, not an AI. I, I mean, I, j I just want to be... No, uh, there is no person to determine what gets to the top of the so ranking. We so it's done by a set of criteria determined by the machine. If you think about the millions of websites out there... Okay, so a machine yeah. determines this. Okay, but you cannot deny the fact that if somebody pays for an ad or somebody pays for an article, you can actually make that search more visible. Am I correct? Maybe not at the top, but it will come out. Do you have that so service? It, it yes, but it depends on... We have very strict policies on what gets to be served as an ad. So uh, misrepresentative content, for instance, will not pass our strict policy to be served as an ad to a user. Okay, so do you have an office here that an individual can go to? I mean, because I, I need to know to what extent you operate as a media entity in the Philippines. Okay, so let's say I would like to post something of relevance. It's based on fact, uh, but it's obviously something I would like to push for. Can I go to Google and then discuss this with you, pay a certain price so that and a certain amount? So let's take, for instance, if you are a health authority and you want to spread uh, and inform users on the need to, say, have a healthy, healthy diet. Indeed, you can work with Google to develop an ad campaign to inform users on the value of healthy eating. That is definitely doable. However, if your claim is that eating rice will cause you cancer, that is clearly not something we will allow as an ad. Okay, um, we, we've mentioned this already, that the Philippines is one of the top social media users and Facebook, Google is like um, very much, well, omnipresent here. Now, I'd like to know how much did you earn from your exposure here in the Philippines, Facebook? How much did you earn last year based on users from the Philippines and your exposure? Um. I appreciate the question, but I'm afraid I cannot give you uh, an answer on that. We do not break down our revenues uh, by individual countries uh, to be able to provide you with that number. You, you can see our, our accounts are public, and they do provide information about how much we make in the major regions of this world, but not individual countries. Okay. So, for example, worldwide, how much did you earn last year? Uh, I, I recall, but I can confirm in writing, that our total revenues are around $40 billion last year. Okay, so for 40 billion gross, right? Or is this gross, that's right. That's gross revenue. Now, perhaps uh, if there are any, you know, anybody here, if the Philippines is like one of the top three users of 40 billion, um, I'm sure we can make some sort of a, I mean, it would be very difficult. But have you paid any taxes in the Philippines? Uh, so we pay tax on the, uh, we follow, we obey the tax rules in every country in which we operate. Uh, again, I can, we can provide uh, information afterwards in terms of what that means in respect of the Philippines, because we do have operations here. Um, but I, c I don't have that number to hand, I'm afraid. Okay. I, I understood we were here to talk about false news and misinformation, which we're very happy to talk about. If there's other information you'd like which is not relevant to that, I'm happy to provide it afterwards. Well, uh, as you know, public hearings go this way. And sometimes while you're here, we do ask those questions. I, I understand, um, but uh, we may not have that information to right. hand. Uh, no, no, no. We will just ask it. And, and of course, um, we know that you're compliant. If there are any um, uh, shortcomings, it would be on our end, because maybe we didn't uh, clarify enough. Uh, the responsibilities of certain uh, foreign media entities. But my point is, uh, I hope that you value also the importance of, of the Philippine market. And, and I know that your presence here uh, is sort of signifying that. But you should also help us. Um, yes, and, and indeed we've had an office. We, uh, we, our office in the Philippines opened in, I think, March 2016. Uh, that office is mainly focused on helping businesses in the Philippines uh, large and small, but particularly large ones, um, make the best use of our platform, both to uh, market their products and services to people in the Philippines, but also abroad. And indeed, that's a big part of the work that Ms. Devi and colleagues have done around s on small businesses. 
Um, I might just add to that, with the small business program that we run, um, partnerships with Connected Women and Bayan Academy, this is providing tr free training, um, often to individuals, about how they can use the free, or as we call it, organic part of our services to get their business online. And we've seen many cases of people being able to put a business up, whether they're freelance designers, virtual assistants, bakers, using free technology to connect to friends and family. I mean, I understand because your, your founder and, um, believes in uh, building the community. And I think this is one example where um, you're doing that. But on the other hand, I think that it's also important to disclose if you have any particular clients in government. Is the government working with you? Is the government um, paying Facebook for a particular service? In terms of the partnerships that we work on with this small business training, these are done as a partnership where often the people we work with provide the reach or the venue as opposed to paying us to deliver it. We provide the services and the training at no cost to the so individual. So what particular department of government? So we're working at a working level with DICT. Um, DICT. We've also met with uh, the Department of Small Business, so we're working with them on how we take what went to five cities last year to seven cities, very much at the working level to get these things out as far as possible. Um, may we ask now our media practitioners, uh, maybe with uh, Ms. Hontiveros. Ma'am, you've heard the statements of uh, Secretary Harry Roque. Okay. What do you think about, well, of course, we need to be able to balance freedom of expression and also responsibility as uh, uh, media practitioners, for example, or government officials. What's your opinion, let's say, on fake news and how to be able to curtail it? and our, our responsibility as media practitioners. Ma'am. Don't ask questions as well as you do, but, <laughs> but you get the drift, right? Not used to this. Um, well, ma'am, for, for CNN Philippines, we have a very strict standards and practices, uh, which we adhere to. Um, we uh, believe in responsibility in journalism. Uh, if, for example, we come across information, uh, we have a two-source rule uh, at the very least, two very reliable and independent sources. Um, uh, in terms of uh, fake news, uh, we are very careful about what we air uh, because everything that comes into the newsroom, we check, counter check, verify, double verify. Uh, we do our best to um, always make sure that what we air is um, uh, uh, very reliable information. Uh, reliable meaning that it comes from uh, an authority, for example, uh, whether it is someone in government or a private individual who would be very knowledgeable. Authority by government. Yeah, yes, no, also. Yeah. Okay. Um, so two, a two-source rule. Okay. Yeah, two, well, that, uh, actually that is uh, one of the very basic rules in journalism. Uh, it is not just us in CNN Philippines that practices that. All the other networks do the same thing. Uh, and that is a minimum. Uh, so, if, for example, if it is a one, if it is a one-source story, we're very, very careful about it. Uh, that's something we've been Philippine media in general has been practicing over the last decades. Uh, yeah. So, what is your opinion now on? I mean, personally, about maybe maybe you can define to me what fake news is. Okay, I mean. Obviously, mm -hmm. it's almost like self-explanatory, hindi makatotohanan. But I'd like to hear it. I mean, from, from each of you that are here. Yeah, like, or Yes, Like each of you does. You just say that. Well, as uh, most journalists understand, uh, journalism is a field of verification. So that anything that anybody says cannot be taken for granted that it's correct, right? <laughs> so, but um, then there are primary sources, secondary sources, tertiary sources. So that if it's primary source, then you take it, 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 it uh, for level of credibility. Then it becomes it's higher compared to a tertiary source, for example. So if you hear it directly from a government official for example, then you understand that since it's a, he's a primary source, he was there, he was present, he's making an announcement, then you understand that it's correct. Therefore, the level of it being fake news is much less 
than, for example, if you heard it from the wind, <laughs> for example, right? So um, in CNN Philippines, as Pia was saying, we do have, I think, 600 pages of standard and practices, 65 points, okay, that it, it would take you, and there's an exam at the end of it, after you read it, to make sure that the quality of the news that we come out with is not is correct in the in, in the sense that the source you heard it directly from the source or that it's been checked double checked so that sometimes we do get information that uh, we find suspicious we don't come up with it until we have two or three people saying the exact same thing and with the same circumstances I think uh, CNN Philippines uh, is very responsible that way because we understand that uh, reputations are at stake and we owe a service to the people that we serve. We're very, very conscious of that and um, I think uh, the problem is not so much journalists because journalists know what their responsibilities are. We are trained to make sure that everything is above board, on the level, and as much as possible um, has been verified over and over again. Um, but then there are other people now that, uh, that because of the explosion, information explosion, and the other sources of information do not have the same kind of uh, necessarily kind of training the journalists have. But they also do provide a balance, right? I mean, of I mean, course. somehow, because they also check mainstream media. Maybe I can ask Ms. Varona, who's, who's a blogger, but appears in mainstream media uh, through the ABS-CBN website. If, if So you have, you, have the, you have both sides. You're a blogger, you're an opinion uh, maker, but you're also uh, responsible because you are in a particular uh, mainstream media site. So tell me, what are your thoughts about this on, on all our discussion today? Aside from being a blog, um, thank you, Madam Chair. Aside from being a blogger, and I, I do write in-depth reports, I used to work with citizen journalism for three years. And the young people in this country are thirsty for knowledge, not only how to vet the information that they gather, how to process them, how to disseminate them in the best way possible, because they instinctively know that if they do it well, it probably increases the odds of problems in their communities getting attention and getting solved. So, so the youth are okay there. No, Dunakunag, um, I totally agree with you when you say government officials do need to be held to a higher standard. No, because um, the government gets mad. I mean, the president gets mad and he hurls fake news charges for every report that he doesn't agree with, even when these have clearly been vetted. But we have Secretary Roque, I'm sorry that he's not here now, um, defending on a spurious fake marketplace of ideas the deliberate spread of disinformation by government officials, including, sorry, Secretary Martin, um, ASEX of the PCO. Okay, so these are two different things. Do I want, do we want a, a legislation against them? No, but we do want government agencies to hold them accountable to the code of conduct and ethical behavior of government employees. Ma'am, can you give me an example of a possible disinformation? That okay. They, yeah. Yes. yes um, it's deliberate and it's systematic. So one very major case back then where both Peter Lavinia and Mocha Uzon were working together when Peter Lavinia, who was still then working with the government, spread this um, patently f false graphic of a young child who had been raped and brutally murdered. And then he had the very, in, where this information is concerned, it's usually the intent that's important. And Peter Lavinia spread this on his Facebook page, picked up by Mocha and, and very many people. And his intention was to denigrate human rights advocates who were then um, protesting EJKs in Metro Manila and telling them, bakit kayo hindi nag-iingay dito sa kawawang batang ni rape? And that child wasn't even in the Philippines. So in exploit yung batang ni rape ng pinatay ni Peter Lavinia when that child was a citizen of Brazil. 
and it took a couple of us journalists to write that out. Now, ito yung problema eh. Kahit mga fans ni President Duterte, and because I followed it on his Facebook page, were appealing to him to take it down because it was definitely not true. Did Lavinia even give them the time of day? No. He ignored it. He was a government official. And yun yun eh, when, they're, when they use, um, the, the law is clear, they cannot separate their um, Facebook accounts from their duties as government officials because they're not supposed to um, to follow one standard in the office and then follow another standard outside, I, as, as you know. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Well, as you know, well, Peter Lavinia is no longer the government, but he didn't issue an apology about that? No, and the next thing we knew, Maka Uzon was actually defending the spread of fake news by saying she's a blogger, not a journalist, and she doesn't have to vet information and all that but she insults all the bloggers including the millions of citizen journalists including high school students who care about the fact that they need to vet information before they put it out you will see citizen journalists correcting each other pag misinformation yung natisod nagkamali they will correct each other they learn quickly but when we get these messages from government officials it it encourages the deliberate spread of lies which never exist in a vacuum. They always come with a secondary campaign of harassing people on the internet who may express dissenting views. Well, thank you, ma'am. I know that this is also a strug struggle by Secretary Andanar, trying to maintain the peace with everybody. Everybody's like headstrong. But how do you deal, let's say, with instances like that? I, I know also Attorney Banag is very reasonable with a good head over her shoulders. But of course, with a very strong network and many, many different opinionated people. Um, how would you answer uh, what uh, Ms. Verona stated? I mean, I, I'm sure you're also appalled when, when certain things like this come out. Sir? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I couldn't answer for Peter Lavinia because, number one, he's not here. He's no longer in government, and uh, I don't work with him. Number two, I've already time and again reiterated that as far as the Presidential Communications Operations Office is concerned, we are very responsible in disseminating information using our official government media platforms, uh, including PTV, including the Radio Pilipinas, Philippine News Agency, and our on-the-ground information agency, which is the Philippine Information Agency. MOCA has a couple of programs under the PCOO, that is the DDS podcast and uh, the Duterte Good News. Both uh, programs are official PCOO programs. And as far as I'm concerned, all of the um, production, all of the stories that we have produced for MOCA in those two uh, programs have been uh, very good. and. Wala namang uh, fake news na, na lumabas dun sa dalawang programa na sponsored by the Presidential Communications Operations Office. Okay, so I've actually seen certain official uh, PCOO postings and I, I know you've been very diligent with your work. Uh, you, you've done a good job, even with PTV4. Uh, basically, with the popularity of the president, you've revived uh, uh, the relevance of the station. So there, but I'm sure that there are also challenges within your organization. Um, maybe, Ms. Banag, you can explain more clearly accountability of uh, well, everybody in the PCO, what what your intention is, what 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 you hope to do to be able to monitor yourselves. 
Madam Chair, thank you for this opportunity. Um, at the PCOO, we make sure, the Secretary makes sure that everything that goes out of our media platforms are vetted. And we have a distribution uh, um, thread that uh, um, studies or looks look into looks into whatever press releases that we have to put out for uh, all of those information officers all over the country to which uh, these uh, news items coming from uh, the presidential communications is addressed as to accountability ma'am we work with the DICT on the policy of uh, the social media um, social media policy for all government employees or officials and it's actually a um, collection of all the laws well that are already existing and insofar as ASEC MOCA is concerned um, if and when other people may see or may think that uh, whatever she's putting out there is libelous as it could uh, if it could or if she says something that would malign other people personally or officially for that matter then they can uh, file a case against ASEC MOCA and uh, um, our office um, Madam Senator would uh, actually opt not to give a definite definition of uh, what fake news is because um, We have reservations, Madam okay. Senator, that um, defining fake news as a state level regulation could raise accompanying risks of a seemingly boundless government regulation and prohibition, which runs counter to freedom of speech and right to self-expression. With that said, Madam Chair, um, in our attempt to create or find a precise definition of fake news in this um, committee we must also consider we suggest that we consider the specific problems or harm harms uh, fake news is doing to undermine our society's ability to participate in a rational discourse and uh, with that said madam chair uh, we are not able like CNN Philippines we are not able to come up with a precise definition of fake news. Okay, I, I know that you're being very cautious, but I see you agreeing, ma'am. You, ag you, you seem to agree with her, not to have, uh, with, with Secretary Banag. Uh, you seem to agree that there's, there's no clear-cut definition. P please uh, state your, your position on this. Yeah, um, I, I think it's, uh, you know, it, it's sometimes if you say that you, what is, what is, Fake to somebody might not might not necessarily be fake to somebody else. Um, so, um, but there are certain rules that journalists go by, which is that if it comes from the government, if, if you have a document that uh, that shows that uh, what you say verbally is correct, then you you have to depend you have to depend on it. You have to believe it, right? So. Uh, but that there are certain parameters that uh, that journalists um, use to decide whether or not something is uh, can go on air or can go to print. Um, so um, we're, I'm very squeamish about having to define something as right or wrong, true or not, because uh, really, uh, who's to say, right? But there are certain expectations so that when, for example, a high government official makes an announcement and then you check it and it turns out that there's no document to back up that policy, for example, or that his lower official says, no, actually that's not, hasn't been vetted, then we have a problem reporting the news because... But you know what? We seem to make this more complicated than it is. Eh? Pag ako, okay, as an ordinary citizen, for example, pag sabi ko fake news, ibig sabihin, hindi totoo or may mali siya para magsinungaling. For example, what's totally fake? It snows in the Philippines. Okay, somebody can probably be a wise aleck and says, oh, minsan nag dito. But we know exactly what we're saying. There are certain things that are 
uh, irrefutable. Okay, that's clear. But I know when you say we have to be very careful because there are certain nuances. But there are also certain instances when you know there's a propaganda. Yes. And that is when the, uh, the line it is blurred. The, the line is blurred. Yes. Okay. So we we have it. Uh, how do you how do you how how do you determine intent and malice? Okay. Yes. So these are the things. But you go back to your safety measures by vetting it, by checking additional sources, etc. Of course, that our people have neither the time or the resources to sometimes double check. That's why uh, it becomes toxic for yes. some, when, 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 especially when you have that much influence. But anyway, so going back to that, pinapahirap pa natin yung definition minsan. Pag sinabi natin fake news, hindi totoo. Pero syempre, hindi totoo, mabigat din ang, ang pwedeng maging basihan kung paano madedetermine na yan. Pero hindi natin mapapagkaila, nasa revised penal code natin yan. Okay. So kung ang huwes ang magdedetermina kung ano yung totoo hindi, sa tingin ko naman malalaman talaga kung may intensyon na malisyoso ang isang taong naghayag ng isang bagay na alam naman natin hindi totoo. Pero siguro, dahil tayo, ako kami ay nasa gobyerno, kayo ay media practitioners, tanungin natin ang akadim <laughs> kung paano siguro ang kanilang definisyon um, nito. Ma'am, uh, Dr. Cheryl Soriano, De La Salle University. I, I think crucial in the identification of what is fake news or disinformation is really intent, no? the intent to deceive. The capacity to create a, a piece of news with the intention to make it appear as real, but clearly, right, uh, uh, clearly um, is false, uh, uh, is an example of this. So there are many different kinds of this. For example, um, one is creating a parody, for example, changing the, uh, as they mentioned earlier, changing the, 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 the um, pretending to be Al Jazeera or pretending to be CNN, but in fact um, is a false site. The next example is, for example, taking a photograph that did not happen on that particular day, but making it appear as if it supports a particular argument or a situation for the purpose of um, creating a political sentiment or emotional sentiment from people. So it, it can vary in different ways, but I think crucial here is the intention to deceive. Okay, so that, I think that's very important. Um, there's malice and intention to deceive. Because sometimes it's very subject, uh, subjective, but there's a phone-in question from Senator Laxon. Kung paano ang workings ng page verification sa FB at kung makakatulong ito sa paglaban sa trolls at fake news, how can page verification in Facebook prevent trolling and spread the fake news? This is a question from Senator Laxon. Um, so we, yes, yeah, so, so this is in, in respect to the blue tick that you might see on someone's page uh, to verify that they are who they say they are. Uh, that's something which is uh, not automated. It involves specialist teams. Either, for instance, when it comes to news organizations, our media partnerships team uh, will have a relationship with that organization to be able to verify that the people who are administering that page do properly represent that organization uh, and uh, and similarly on the uh, side of uh, policy makers we have a, a team that has a relationship with um, uh, with policy makers including for instance senators here in the Philippines who will authenticate that this uh, page is owned and operated by either that individual or their staff so it's it's a human connection uh, rather than a tech, rather than a machine that uh, that determines that something is authentic and verified. And so, if it's reported that it's um, not authentic, you will take it down. Uh, we will in certain circumstances, and indeed, there has been a case uh, under some, one of the senators who's not here uh, today who reported to us fairly recently. I think it was 24 uh, pages that uh, Senator Gordon uh, reported to us 24 cases of. Um, uh, if you like imposter accounts uh, and we took down I think all but one of them um, because yes we were able to confirm that they were indeed uh, inauthentic uh, and attempting to represent Senator Gordon. Misrepresent. I yeah. think I think um, one of my colleagues um, Senator Soto's Facebook page was blocked also but that was an authentic page. Are you familiar with this? I, I'm not familiar. I don't know whether Ms. DV is. Um, do you are? I think I think he did, but, but anyway, okay. Oh, sorry. Um, 
Anyone? <laughs> Mr. Noku. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm going to ask questions from our uh, Facebook okay, representative. Okay, you can ask me. Then yes, I'll ask them. through you. Uh, since it has been mentioned in the presentation, one is, uh, do they see, it has been pointed out in some news reports, both international and local, about a state-sponsored uh, misinformation. And uh, Philippines has been cited along with Russia, uh, Turkey, China, and North Korea to be to be maintaining cyber warrior or armies. Uh, in Korea, North Korea, they even have one community of uh, of cyber warriors. Just uh, just uh, you know, influencing the news. Also in, in Russia. In the Philippines, apparently we do. And, and the Philippines has been cited in some news reports. Okay. As uh, also having that kind of machinery. So All right. I want to find out from Facebook whether that is true. Okay. Or do they see such pattern? Um, Facebook. I'm sure that you know where all of the the comments, interactions are coming from. If a particular area, have you investigated this allegation? We certainly have investigated allegations around state-sponsored activity by Russia um, in respect of the U.S. and the U.K., which is my home country, and we've, we have reported on both of those. In the U.S., as you'll be aware, uh, our colleague uh, and senior counsel Colin Stretch has given extensive evidence to the U.S. Um, Congress on what we found in respect of um, not necessarily state, but certainly Russian uh, clusters of accounts and activity by something called the Internet Research Agency, um, which was spending money and running ads uh, directed at American users of Facebook during uh, the uh, presidential election campaign. Um, and we've reported on that extensively. All that is in the public domain. Anybody can see it. I can also, um, in, in we also looked at uh, in response to questions from parliamentarians in the UK, whether there was similar interference uh, in respect of the EU referendum vote, which took place um, in June 2016. And I, the last act I undertook before I left the UK to move to this region was to let uh, that parliamentary committee know that we had found no evidence of a similar cluster of activity targeting the UK from Russia. Um, I, I, I know we, we can and do investigate whether there are actions that have been taken from uh, attacking people or our network um, uh, across a range of countries. I'm afraid I cannot tell you definitively um, uh, what we found in respect of all of those countries that you've mentioned. But there's been findings about Russian actors apparently, right? Have Th you determined that's, that's that? That's on the record. Um, in the U.S., we're happy to send you a link to our extensive but evidence. But do you provided. have any particular official position on this assertion? On what, sorry? On, on, on supposed influence by Russian actors in the outcome of the 2016 elections in the U.S.? Yes, we have, and it's all in, on, in the public domain, and we can send that to you. Well, well can you tell me in, in yes, a I mean, short... Yes, in, in, in short, in, in a kind of um, briefly, we did find evidence of a cluster of, I think it was something like 230 accounts uh, operated by an organization called the Internet Research Agency from Russia, uh, which was spending money uh, buying advertising on Facebook, um, uh, not particularly supporting different candidates, but to show, sow division uh, on uh, using, using tools in our platform. Um, it's something that we uh, have, we taken steps once we became aware of that to take those accounts down, obviously. And we want to take steps to ensure that that cannot and does not happen again, not just in the U.S., but anywhere. Uh, and that's okay. one of the reasons why we've really increased the amount of resources that we put into this work. Sir, do you have the capability, for example, to, to check if there's a particular issue that comes out um, on Facebook, and then you have several responses and if you zero in on those responses, you will be brought, I mean, do you have the capability to determine if it is within a contained area? 
Um, the, the, the reason why I'm saying is this is um, if there there's probably a, a call center that that's all they do is comment on a particular topic. Have you uh, found that out or determined that in the Philippines? Or are you even making an effort to? I'm not aware of as particular findings in the Philippines, but as I mentioned earlier in my pre in response to a previous question, um, the kinds of activity we've seen in the Philippines, including the creation of multiple fake accounts and attempts to spread misinformation, is similar to that which we found elsewhere. Um, Would you be able but my to understanding is that the concerns yeah. here are not about uh, other states uh, interfering. It is much more around activity within the Philippines, directed at the Philippines. Um, that, 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 so, uh, but other than that, I don't have specific information to relate to this uh, hearing about activity we found in the Philippines. Okay, you sir. But um, would would you exert um, resources and also time to be able to determine if such incidents exist? Because you know the Philippines, we're really known to be like one of the best uh, service providers for business process outsourcing, call centers. So. I'm not even saying that it happens here, but uh, I want to know if it happens here. So, so would, would, would it not be worth your time to invest in this? So some of the things that we have done specifically in the Philippines is act on abusive behavior, um, taking things down both in terms of abuse and then also working to some of the earlier points around clickbait. Miss Claire, uh, very quickly, when you say abusive behavior, is it based on a post or based on a comment on a post? So according to our c community standards, we do not tolerate hate speech or incitement of violence, whether that occurs in a post or in comments. Okay. Uh, where they are reported to us and it violates community standards, we will take those things down. Uh, we also broadened our definition of what is an inauthentic account um, to try and catch these things before they start. Okay, ma'am, if you can tell me, um, again, you're trying to balance uh, the freedom to express and sometimes it's an outlet you know in facebook you're so upset you know the government they're not doing their job you know people in government are useless but what would constitute hate speech it's okay um babala sa mga nanonood ng mga bata ha pwede you you can be very candid here um is it a curse a vulgar curse um what if it's actually a news feed can you, can, you, can you give me an example? A curse, any curse would be it, hate speech? It could be a range of things. What we have is a, a series of what's called protected categories. So there are, cate so there are it, this is all about people, um, but we could see, we can he see hate speech directed about against somebody because of their gender, because of their nationality, because of their race, uh, because of their sexuality, and there are several other. Uh, uh, How about their we physical well-being? Um, uh, their, ab their physical ability, you know, we, we could have that, so you cannot direct hate speech against somebody because they're, they're physically disabled, for instance. So, so there are a so range of different categories. How do you and do the it? kind of speech, well, the range of speech could be, I mean, to give you an example, um, you, uh, and actually religious belief, you can't say I, I, I want to kill Catholics or I hate Catholics. It's not allowed on Facebook. You can be critical of a religion. You can say I hate Catholicism or I hate Islam. Um, but you cannot you cannot right. hate people because of their religious belief, and so th there are and obviously we look at that in respect of, uh, of many different languages. We have many different language experts, uh, and this is something that we are learning all the time. And one of the reasons for increasing our resources in this area from 10,000 people who work on this to 20,000 by the end of this year is so that we can improve the quality of our decisions because we know that we sometimes make mistakes. So your 20,000 people goes through. I uh, go no, through. No, no, it's not that. It's more that. What do they um, do? So, uh, a, a number of things, but a, a good part of what they do is review reports. So, any piece of content on Facebook can, and indeed, if you believe, you, if you see something on Facebook you do not think is, you think is breaching our terms, including, for instance, for hate speech, report it to us. And every piece of content reported to us uh, will be reviewed by a human being uh, to determine whether or not this breaches our terms. So, that's why we need thousands of people. To help us do that. Okay, Miss Varona, you are raising your hand. Then I'll go back to Mr. Nokum. Then I want to hear the NBI, huh? Okay, ma um, yes, ma'am. Um, I'd like to well ask you to address this question to them, because I've been blocked by Facebook. Um, 
and in a very strange case where the Facebook program told me that I had that I had violated community standards and I was suspected to be a fake account, which was very, very strange because I've been a verified account since around 2014. So um, I do thank the Facebook executives that we've run to for for addressing our concerns. But it's the third party um, groups that we're pretty wary of because um, aside from being blocked, and I've been, I think I, I've counted three times where I've I've been, you know, kicked um, out for a day. What or two. were you discussing at the time? Oh, the Marco, um, the Marco says it's always about the Marco says yes, that I find myself in trouble. No, no, no. That. That, I mean, I, I, I'm not saying that I agree or I disagree. I haven't read it. Yeah. But it also happened to Gang Kapati. Yes. Gang Kapati. It's um, for, right. for me. It's about Marcos. So it's always yeah, the Marcos it? issue. And um, another time, I'm also worried because one time I did report a threat, a sexual overt rape threat on Rappler reporter Pierre Anada to Facebook. And it came back to me that it was not violating community standards. And this was a guy showing his hand and saying this was what he was going to do to Pia with a picture of Pia. And he came back at me and said it was not violating community standards. And I actually got into, a, I felt silly um, debating with a program, a person I didn't know at all. And I said, how can you, how can you say that? And then eventually I did go to Facebook executives, they said they would look into it. Eventually the program, not the executives, the program came back at me and said, okay, upon, upon your um, checking your report, um, we've decided it's a fake account. But I wasn't reporting a fake account. I was reporting a rape threat on a journalist. Miss Claire, would you be able to answer this? You know, um, I'm not even saying this has anything to do with the Marcoses or anything. I mean, is there a program already uh, in um, Facebook that says any, if these are the topics that are to be discussed, then it will be automatically flagged down? Because I just find it so coincidental that it happens. That's number one. Number two, about the report, which is quite disturbing. It doesn't matter which, which side again. Um, this is about rape and why did she get that response? I mean, it, doesn't, it didn't seem like it was vetted by your group, ma'am. So I think, first of all, for that to happen to anyone or any kind of threat like that is a horrible thing to have happen and not something that we want on our platform. Um, we have very clear policies in this area around inciting violence and rape and we don't allow it. Um, in terms of some of the other incidents that have been brought up, without having them specifically in front of me, there is nuance and we've made mistakes. We've apologised when we made mistakes. Things have been taken down or things have been returned to the platform where we found we were in error. And we continue to try and work with people as these things come up, both in terms of our reporting tools and then also in terms of people, bloggers like Inde, to understand where these issues occur. But I just want to be really clear, for that to happen to someone is just a horrible thing that we don't want happening on Facebook. You know, I appreciate that, ma'am. Of course, we all make mistakes. There are certain things that we cannot always monitor and it slips us. But um, do you have a copy of that, that they said that this is not a violation? Yes, I do. I have screen screenshots okay. of that, and I'd be willing to email it. And I must give um, Facebook executives credit. Once I had reported it, they did act on it. But you know, um, I, I'm sure there are few journalists who 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 engage with them. I'm worried about the rest of the netizens who may not have the same access to Facebook that we do, madam. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Milner. We share your concern. Um, we do recognise that one of the um, uh, and indeed one of the reasons why our chief executive has, uh, has particularly focused his efforts and the efforts of uh, thousands of, of us on this issue is that we have not done a good enough job uh, and we should not be a service where you have to rely on the fact that you have a relationship with somebody in Facebook to try and get a problem that, that like this fixed. We have to do better. Uh, and indeed that's absolutely what we're determined to do. You asked specifically about could we be using technology better? Absolutely. 
Uh, it's something that we have um, already been doing in, if you like, more black and white areas like terrorism. So we increasingly now have used technology to identify content which is spread by people who wish to support global terrorist organizations like ISIS, uh, where um, instead of relying on reports, we, we actually have now trained our machines uh, to find this content. So 99% of the content we take down, which is ISIS related, we have found ourselves, it has not yet been reported to us. Now, so what we want to do is now take what we've learned from that area and apply it to others. It is harder in the context of something like hate speech um, because often people will use what one might call hot language, like I hate you, I could kill a McDonald's now, and I notice I'm saying that just as the food's coming around. I don't eat McDonald's, I would say. Um, uh, but some of that language that people will use in a hateful context, they will also use in a jocular context with their friends and their family. So hate speech is a much, much harder issue to get right with technology, but that doesn't mean we're giving up on it. We are doing our best to try and address that. Um, and actually, forums like this and hearing from the experts in this room and for those who've, who've had bad experiences really helps us and helps our colleagues who work on this to get better at it. Uh, and we hope that by the time, you know, in a year's time, you'll see a really significant improvement. We'll have fewer mistakes, never zero, I'm afraid, but fewer mistakes um, and an increasing sense of that Facebook is getting more right than, much more right than it gets wrong. You know, I, I appreciate the, you're showing sympathy and uh, um, being able to to feel uh, the situation. And in fact, I can see it in you, Miss uh, Miss Claire, because you, you're a woman too. Um, I think that there's, there really should be no room for that. But I know it's very difficult to filter billions of information that come in. So as long as we know that there's an effort uh, to be able to, to stop these sorts of hate speech, um, things that are violative of uh, um, the dignity of women, of men, of, of children, anybody. Um, I, I think that uh, we need to have your commitment on that also in this country because uh, we would like to monitor all these things, but of course we, we, we cannot always do that. But um, Mr. Nokum, do you have anything else to add before I go to uh, the NBI and then uh, Ms. Uh, Cheryl? Sir? Yes, Madam Chair. We, we support your call on Facebook to, to, have a, uh, to investigate and to have a bigger monitoring role in the Philippines because Mr. Myler himself, himself said that we are the second biggest market and for a market of uh, 60 million, I think uh, 20,000 is uh, very few people to, to be watching on that market. And, and also, um, Ms. Uh, Claire mentioned about the click farms. You know, in the country, we have dictatorship by numbers among social media operators harassment by numbers because just because this blogger or this social media personality has 5 million, 2 million, 3 million uh, followers, then, you know, they use that number. But we, we also uh, see a pattern where many of, of that number, the likes, the shares, and the comments were bought through click farms. And, the, and these click farms exist in Bangladesh, India, and th that's a fact. I don't, I don't know whether Facebook has monitored this, but, uh, you know, th this click farm has uh, click farms, and even in the country, they have become a multi-million industry as well. Thank you for calling our attention to that. Um, are you familiar with this term, click farms, and have you investigated that, sir? Uh, I've certainly seen reports on it. I'm not an expert on it, but we have, um, you know, th this is exactly the kind of abusive behavior. Uh, that we are uh, deploying resources to address. So it's, it's both um, abusive behavior by individuals, sometimes because they just haven't understood the nature of what's uh, appropriate on a platform like Facebook, and indeed that's one of the reasons why the partnerships that Ms. Devi talked about earlier um, uh, here in the Philippines, and we have many other similars around the world, are really important, because people often just make mistakes. They say things they don't mean to say, uh, but what you're talking about is organized um, and, it's, and it's determined. And so that's the kind of stuff that needs a different, a different type of 
activity dope both to detect it and to address it at scale and we're absolutely determined to invest in both areas to help individuals and to address that uh, that kind of organized activity on our platform. But sir do you have the capability to be able to determine if uh, certain comments, likes, clicks are coming from a particular area? Uh, uh, we, we do and okay, indeed so that's what, what, what are you doing about it? Well, I m we've mentioned earlier, I, I, I hope you, you've recognized that some of the, the investment we're making is not just 20,000 people to review reports. Yeah, uh, many of those thousands of people are also experts in uh, internet security, uh, in, uh, in the behavior of bad actors, so that we can uh, protect our community at scale from their activities by taking down ten, you know, tens of thousands of fake accounts, for instance, by blocking whole domains from having access to Facebook and to creating accounts. And, and these are, I, I can't, I'm afraid I'm not able to give you information about which countries these are emanating from, uh, but this is a global phenomenon. And every um, country that I've been responsible for, this is something that policymakers are rightly concerned about. So we are, uh, wherever the threats are coming from, from whichever country, uh, we're determined to get better at tackling them and also to work with industry colleagues, including our colleagues in Google uh, and, and other companies who are not represented here, uh, to learn from each other. Uh, and this is an, uh, that community of um, security engineers are very communal. They like to learn from each other and understand what threats are taking place. Uh, and where appropriate, we can also learn from governments. Uh, because governments are also interested in protecting the cyber security of their nations. Uh, so that's something where we aim to collaborate as much as is possible uh, in sharing information about threats and how to tackle them. Uh, Sec Martin, I'm nice to you because I'm going to be sister-in-law. <laughs> okay, uh, Sec Martin, go ahead. Well, Madam Chair, thank you. I'd like to uh, address the question to you so you can address them. The the suggestion. Uh, since we had the second hearing uh, a few uh, uh, a couple of months back, we have made strides at the BCOO to fight false news or disinformation. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, four weeks ago we had the National Information Convention, which gathered over 1,800 government and private information officers nationwide uh, and it just saddens me because we invited Facebook to attend so that they can help us and at least uh, teaching or informing all of the information officers that were present there and it was the first time that the government actually gathered 1,800 information officers and if if uh, the other IOs from the barangays just had the means to attend, I'm sure they would have attended. And our target, Madam Senator, is to have an information officer in every barangay, which is 42,000. Uh, we invited, we extended our invite to Facebook, but they, they sent their regrets. Uh, and number two, my colleague at the Philippine Information Agency, D uh, Director General Harold Clavite, had a very sad experience also. During the height of the Marawi siege, there was a video that went around on Facebook, which was uploaded, and I'm assuming uploaded by uh, the ISIS, or, or a sympathizer of uh, the Maute group. And uh, Director Howie Clavite reported this to Facebook and it was not acted after two or three months. So I would like for you to address the, the question and concern and suggestion to Facebook, Madam Chair. Thank you. Okay, first of all, Facebook, with uh, your presence in the Philippines, I don't think it's too much to ask for you to have a representative in every government function that requests your presence. This is the best way to be able to feel your, um, uh, what do you call this, your involvement in the community. And not just in the, the government sector, but even in the private sector. But you should definitely, if not, make the Philippines a hub. I mean, give us uh, a little bit more credit than you are already uh, extending to us. I'm sure 
that um, at this point, we're not even very clear about uh, the fees that Facebook should be paying or any other uh, international media outlets. And I'm not one who's going to be pushing for that, but at least extend us the courtesy and be present as you have here, which I appreciate. But in all of these gatherings, I think you're already part of the Philippine community. So you cannot treat yourself as just a foreign entity in this country. Otherwise, you would also not be getting the same courtesy from us. So that's one. So answer me and tell me why you weren't there. And then number two, also by this um, concern of Secretary Andanar about the Marawi incident video, am I, am I correct? That they didn't address immediately. Am I correct, sir? Okay. Uh, Ma'am. Okay, first of all, I will, the event uh, specifically, um, I agree with you and I hear you. This is, I think, my seventh trip already this year to the Philippines. Um, and as Simon Then you should just be based here. <laughs> What's the population of other countries compared to the Philippines? I mean, we have to be able to assert now uh, our uh, buying power, our presence in the international community, not just in the Philippines, but all over the world because of our overseas Filipino workers. You should have a main office here in the Philippines. We are sick and tired of having to call you in Singapore to come here. I mean, we appreciate your help. We, we, we appreciate the presence of Singapore and, and, and other international ASEAN communities in the Philippines um, and, and your cooperation. But the Philippines should have a main Facebook office here, especially with the number of citizens that, that uh, patronize uh, Facebook. Please go ahead and explain. Yeah, I hear you. And as um, Simon mentioned, we did op open an office here last year, which continues to grow. So we are investing. Um, one of the challenges with uh, events such as the PC001 is the staff that are here at the moment. But again, we're growing the type of staff that work here. Um, we are actually working with the PCOO on an event coming up for ASEAN and Japan in the area. So where we can, we really try. Um, in terms of our programmatic work, how we're working with the government departments, we're also taking a train-the-trainer model. So so providing the skills that they can also have training on Facebook locally and by the departments to make it easier when we're not here all the time. But I hear you on that and we welcome invitations. Can I just add to that? Um, y yes, sir. Uh, I, I understand and indeed I, your um, heartfelt um, demand. I've heard from policymakers in other countries that have demanded to know why we don't have more people on, on the ground, and including why we don't have a phone number that people can phone when they have a problem. Um, we have built a platform used by more than 2 billion people around the world, including 66 million people here in the Philippines. We genuinely believe the best way that we can help people, including uh, officials in government to make the best use of our service is not necessarily by employing hundreds of people in a particular country. Actually, the, the nature of these services is that by employing people in hubs like Singapore and others around the world, we can actually provide incredibly effective support for communities across the country. Now, we, are, we do have an office here. It's growing. We will have a permanent policy representative here soon once we've hired that person. And so we do recognize the Philippines is a, is a big and important country for us. But I, I think you should judge us not just by how many people we employ, but also the partnerships we have, the actions we are taking when the tens of thousands of people in the Philippines who probably report content to us, how effective are we at doing that? If I might respond to the particular issue that was raised in respect of this particular piece of content, my understanding is that this content was initially shared by people to condemn the actions. And that's often what we see, is that people will share content, um, which is, uh, as it were, propaganda content from terrorist organizations in order to condemn it. Um, we, uh, and, and we recognize that that sometimes can mean things which look, appear, look and appear very uncomfortable can appear on our platform. Actually, once we understood uh, the government's concerns about that, we did act on that content, so that content was removed. But you know, I do recognize that's part of, once we have a permanent policy representative here again, that kind of conversation can take place more quickly. 
uh, because that person will understand the local context better. So I hear you, but I do not think the solution is always you must employ hundreds more people in a country to understand it. Sir, um, no, no, no. Um, I think this was just Mr. Nokum's uh, concern that 20,000 cannot possibly monitor, let's say, 2 billion or even six, 60 million in the Philippines. Okay. Um, what we're just saying is that, of course, it's different if there's a human being uh, that we can interact with here. I know you had a policy representative. Maybe you're in transition now. I wonder, I mean, I'm sure the perks of Facebook is uh, quite good compared to other multinational companies in the Philippines. I wonder why that person wouldn't stay. Is it because the role of that person is uh, not taken seriously? I, I think uh. that whoever you employ as a policy representative in the Philippines should be somebody you take seriously, somebody you respect, and somebody you feel has the authority to be able to tell you the real situation. Because we also want you insulated from opinions of government or, or the, the private sector, but at the same time responsive to the needs of um, actually the regular citizens in the country. You, you cannot be um, partisan in, in a country. I, I understand that you have to maintain neutrality, but you also have to be responsive to real concerns. So a person that you, you will respect and listen to and not just a dummy that you will install in the Philippines would, would I think, be more productive for us both. I'm very happy to give you that reassurance. Um, I've hired uh, many people in my time at Facebook over the last six years, and every one of them uh, that I've hired, including people that have then moved on to other roles, uh, the most important thing is that they really understand uh, and are members of uh, the community that they are there to serve. Uh, the people who, were, wherever we hire here in, in the Philippines, will be a bridge between uh, the, com the community of the Philippines and our company. And that means that they will both inform people here about what our company is doing uh, to address concerns, and to, uh, and, but also to make um, our service even better for people in the Philippines. So maybe we'll go from four hours to five hours because people will enjoy it so much. Um, but also they will also be a very good voice for the Philippines in the company. And that's true also of the rest of our colleagues in, in the Philippines office. So it won't just be the role of the policy person. I, I describe these jobs as both the best jobs in Facebook but also the worst. Uh, they're the best jobs because you get to represent the country you love and the people uh, that you um, that, that you're of, as it, as it were, you get to represent them. But also you get real challenges. They're, they are, these are tough roles, so they're not easy to find people, but I can absolutely assure you, whoever we appoint into this role will command our full respect uh, and will, will be an important interlocutor for you and your colleagues here. A woman, I hope. I can't uh, guarantee of course, you that. The most qualified, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying. The most qualified. I don't want to be <laughs> uh, prejudiced to a particular group, but uh, Ms. Ms. Soriano. Thank you, Madam Chair. A couple of questions, hopefully, that you could uh, ask Facebook as well. Um, reports last year um, showed that about 30,000 fake news accounts were purged for the impending French elections. If Facebook was able to do this in France, can Facebook do this as well in the Philippines, meaning purge fake accounts that they already know, huh? they, they can identify to be fake? The second question I would like, if they could clarify, is the issue on precision seed targeting. Um, Social network theorists have argued that the most important catalyst for the spread of fake news was the precision by which the purveyor targeted an audience, a task that can be accomplished using the data that these platforms routinely sell and gather to advertisers as well. The key was to seed an initial cluster of believers who would share or comment on the item, recommending it to others through Twitter or Facebook. False stories spread further when they were initially aimed at poorly informed people who had a hard time telling if a claim was true or false. So it's precision targeting. When marketers use information on surfing habits, opinions, and social connections to aim ads at people with just the right interests, this can facilitate beneficial economic exchange, but in the wrong hands, the technology becomes a means for precision seeding of propaganda. So can Facebook clarify, for example, can social media platforms make more transparent the ad spending of specific political campaigns and user targeting on its site? So two questions, Madam Chair. Facebook, would you like to answer the first question first, and then we'll go to the next? Um, 
So on the issue, you specifically asked about um, are we targeting fake accounts in the Philippines? The answer is yes. We're targeting fake accounts everywhere. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, we expect to be able to say more about that in due course later this year about the effectiveness of our actions. Um, on the issue of ads targeting, do you want to take this? Or should, I mean, go, go. Um, so uh, I can absolutely reassure you, do not have an ad targeting tool that enables you to target people on the, the fact that they're less well informed. But we do, uh, and I also want to correct, we do not sell data. Absolutely not. There is no selling of people's data on Facebook. What we enable um, uh, organizations, whether that be charities, small businesses, and Ms. Devi can talk about, uh, about uh, how we guide them on this, uh, but also political campaigns, um, we provide tools that enable to them to target their messaging in an efficient way. Uh, and indeed, the relevance of advertising is something that uh, Facebook enables at scale. Um, but we do recognize there are concerns about the transparency of that advertising. Uh, and, and this concern that if you like, certain people are seeing some messages and other people are seeing other messages, and it's hard for campaigns to respond if you can't see the other person's <coughs> message. So we are now absolutely committed to full transparency around messaging, not just for political campaigns, for, but for all advertising. So in due, we're, we're trialing this at the moment in Canada, but in due course later this year, for all advertising on Facebook, you'll be able to look at any page and see what ads it's running. And so you can see if your opponent in a campaign, even including if that's a local campaign, uh, you can see exactly what ads they're running and you can respond to them. We think this will be a major step forward yeah. in, in advertising transparency and something we know uh, that our community really wants to see. So we're committed to, do it, to doing it. It's coming. It will be absolutely global. Um, uh, and so watch this space and we will, we will make sure, hopefully our lo new local representative will be able to inform you of that. But if that person's not here, by the time we do it, we'll be letting you know. Thank you, Mr. Milner. Um, maybe the NBI. Um, is there an NBI representative, sir? Is it you? NBI representative, meron ba kayong uh, ugnayan sa mga social media platforms kung meron kayong mga iniimbestigahan, kunyari yung Facebook o kaya uh, yung Google, sir? Kasi kunyari, uh, child pornography, ngayon nila live stream o mga bagay na ganon. Uh, meron ba kayong kakilala na sa kanila na madali ninyong matatawagan? Paano po ninyo iniimbestigahan ito? Ma'am, uh, Madam Senator, Meron silang facility, ma'am, for law enforcement. But uh, for other cases, but in so far as libel cases is concerned, they do not respond to, uh, to our uh, any query that uh, will be coming from us. Meron na ba kayo napadala, sir? Uh, usually, ma'am, as a matter of procedure, uh, we send them uh, communication in so far as identifying yung IP addresses. Pero hindi po kayo sinasagot? Hindi pa, ma'am. Uh, I know the challenges, ma'am, uh, because of the voluminous request coming from law enforcement around, around the globe. Pero hindi, hindi ma'am. Hindi talaga. Pero wala ba kayong automatic, like, um, uh, we received your complaint or your letter, your correspondence, and we will respond to you within a certain number of days, sir? Wala po, ma'am. Uh, for libel cases lang, ma'am. Okay. Um... Sir, uh, I'm, I'm hope I understood uh, that. I'm using our, our good colleague here, Chris. Wait, is, is your translator a Filipino? Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. okay. Um, <laughs> uh, I, actually, I'd quite like, if you don't mind, just to touch on the issue you raised about child live streaming of child abuse, um, because I I want to. Uh, the Philippines is a member of the We Protect initiative, uh, which is an initiative of involving many governments around the world technology companies uh, and charities to address this issue of child abuse online. Um, I was at the uh, first event of that in which there was a combined presentation by the specialist unit in the Philippines, police, and the UK specialist uh, organization, CEOP, with our colleague, who one of our colleagues who is uh, who liaises with um, law enforcement around the world to show how we can help, we can support um, police forces here and in, in Europe to, to come together 
to share information in order to, most importantly, safeguard those poor children in those terrible situations, but also to bring the perpetrators of those crimes to justice, both the people who are paying for those crimes, often in Europe, and the, the gangs who are organizing that vile abuse uh, here in the Philippines and elsewhere. So that's an area where we have a strong record of cooperation uh, with law enforcement around the world, and particularly in the Philippines, to address those concerns. Okay, but sir, there, there's another concern here. Um, I know that you probably get thousands of uh, libel complaints every day, but I think there should be a mechanism by which you actually respond to local authorities, and in particular our National Bureau of Investigation. Do you have a liaison um, that works with law enforcement in the Philippines? We do. Yeah. We do have a... Uh, uh, may, we, may we have the name of that person, and can you please provide us that person's name and contact information? Uh, it's my colleague Jeff Wu, is our, the person who leads this and relationship And is he based in us. the Philippines, sir? He's not based in the Philippines, but he absolutely has a relationship with law enforcement here. Okay, will you have a law enforcement, I mean, law enforcement liaison desk here in the Philippines? I think you should have one. Well, thank you for your input on that. I'm, I'm not able to give you a direct answer on it now. It's not a decision that I would make. But that doesn't mean that what we, doesn't mean therefore we won't be responsive. We are responsive. We have a law enforcement response team that takes requests from law enforcement here and in uh, other countries in this region. They're based in this region so they can respond in a timely way to those requests. And we publish public data for the Philippines, as we do for other countries, on how many requests we get and in how many we provide Where, where do I obtain that data, I sir? Can, I can say, we can send you the link no, to no. it. Okay, I appreciate that you can send it to our office, but if I'm a regular citizen... Yes, uh, straightforwardly. Actually, the best way is to use our colleague here from Google. Go on Google, look up Facebook government request reports, <laughs> and that will take you direct... It's the best way. So there's re take reciprocity, you, take you all yeah. right. No, they just got yeah. a very good search engine, uh, and it will take you directly to that report. We okay. publish a report every six months, and you'll see information there about, about how we respond. No, you, you know what, sir? I, I also understand what you're saying, that, that the person not, doesn't necessarily have to be here to be responsive. I see that, like you do this on a regional basis. On the other hand, also, we just sheer number of people here in the Philippines. I think that uh, it also sends a good um, uh, message to us that we are important, uh, that there is a human factor to Facebook, and it's not just all technology. Uh, there's a, a little bit of a human factor connection. Maybe, maybe that's all um, to send us your, your, your pure intent to be able to help in community building as your founder um, has focused on that particular message recently. So I think that would be one, because how you say community building when you don't really have a representative in that country that we can we can interact with uh, in the flesh. I mean, then, I mean that's one thing. Okay, um, maybe I can ask Mr. Tonya Cruz your thoughts on our discussion today, sir. Magandang tanghali po. Madam Chair, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that Facebook uh, appeared before the committee to shed light on what it has been doing. Uh, but I think they have uh, the problem uh, could not be in the platform. Uh, Madam Chair, for example, we have many public officials here present. Um, they have or maintain Facebook pages, websites, and, and many other digital properties. They are funded by our taxpayers. The management is funded by taxpayers. We employ staff to take care of these Facebook pages, to produce content. Um, I think it is ultimately the responsibility of government to have clear rules. For example, it's quite absurd, Madam Chair, na magsusumbong tayo sa Facebook, na may hate crime dito sa Facebook page ng gobyerno. O dito sa Facebook page ng Presidente or dito sa Facebook page ng Assistant Secretary. I think, the, uh, Madam Chair, my point is, um, because we're talking about accountability and responsibility, even before we ask Facebook, I'm sure we're not the only government, we're not the only country that uh, uses Facebook. 
uh, considering that the government values Facebook and social media, uh, I think we should, we sh uh, the Senate, the Senate could, could use its influence to try to compel executive offices to lay down their own guidelines. For example, is hate crime acceptable in the pages of the Office of the President? What 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 happens Sir, if uh, give me give me an example because you know, I am not very uh, up to date when it comes to these things I don't check it daily but give give me an example was there an instance where there was a, a hate uh, message in an official page sir I'm referring for example for example Madam Chair uh, in posts of uh, officials identified with the government in the comments pages for example of government government Facebook pages. Uh, there are like, uh, I'm sorry. What government Facebook pages, sir? Um, PCOO. May merong hate messages? In the comments, for example. Ah, in the comments. Well, I don't think they can control control that all the time. But how about the official ones? Uh, no, Madam Chair. Uh, give me an example of your concern. I, I for I example, Madam Chair. If, for example, comments like threatening rape or murder against opponents of the president are made in a Facebook page managed by the office of the president, what would the head of office do? Would they just allow the comment to stay? Hindi ba nila tinatanggal? Hindi po. Kaya nga po lumalaganap na okay lang na magmure. Eh. Na okay lang mag-threaten ng na grave threats or verbal abuse or unjust fixation. Mama, ama, sana mamatay yung buong pamilya mo. Sana ma, ma, ma rape ka rin. Sana ma rape ka ng brutal. We find these pages, uh, we, we find these comments, for example, in uh, news websites, but thankfully our news websites have comments policies. They're very responsible. It's a very tiring job, but they, 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 they delete. So tinatanggal nila. Because they, they, they are responsible for the platform. For, for the website, bawal yun eh, sa kanilang comments policy. You cannot threaten violence, hate, etc. But oddly, Madam Chair, in our government pages, there's no such policy. And it's, it, I, I find it personally weird that we have to tell Facebook that there's a problem. When in fact, that should be the responsibility of heads of offices. Okay, so sinasabi mo, Tonyo, um, Kasi ako, kunyari, uh, pupunta ako sa inquirer site, no? pupunta ako sa comments. There are a lot of uh, hurtful comments about anybody. Doesn't matter, pula ka, itim, uh, dilaw, may hurtful comments. Pero wala pa naman, ako nakikita ang sana ma-rape ka, sana mapatay ka, dun, dun, ha? So, either they clean it up to make sure that these violative uh, statements are removed. Or it just never happens in those sites. But I find it unlikely that it'll never happen in those sites because there are certain things that are also kind of... Um, but you're saying that in PCOO sites, or at least in officers of the PCOO that maintain their own sites, you can see these comments. Am I correct? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. Uh, parang alimbawa po, sa, sa Senado, meron po tayo mga, may, may code of conduct ang mga attendees sa Senado, hindi po tayo pwedeng kumalakpak kapag may plenary session. Tapos, kapag merong kumalakpak, pwede ka agad na sabihan ng Actually, security. Actually, gusto ko ipa-amend yun eh. Yung palakpak, okay lang yun, di ba? So, ginam ginamit no, no, ko no, lang but, po example. No, I, I agree Pero halimbawa right. nga po, uh, we, our government, our government prides itself with uh, very strong social media presence it should be responsible. They should, they should be models for responsibility online that we don't have to, to communicate with Facebook that these things are happening. Kasi, alimbawa, kung uh, ang mga, mga Facebook pages po ng mga ahensya ng gobyerno ay modelo, ay bawal dito ang bastos. Bawal dito ang nagmumura. Dapat ginagalang ang babae, bata, may kapansanan. Dapat kapag may sagot, uh, kapag may tanong ang isang mamayan na nilagay sa Facebook as comment, meron po bang response time? Halimbawa, magtatanong sa Pangulo, 
pahina ng PCO, ano po bang patakaran nila dyan? Wala po eh. So, sa mga private, talimbawa, sa mga private na mga ahensya, sa mga kumpanya, meron po yan. Meron na pong Meron na pong mataas na level ng responsibility. May response time nga po. Eh. Alimbawa sa mga brands, gusto nila within an hour, makapag-reply sila sa increase ng kanilang customer. Uh, pero sa gobyerno natin, wala. Tapos nakikita po natin yung mga, mga principal na official ng gobyerno sa impormasyon, na kailangan pa natin magsumbong sa Facebook. Pero meron ka mga screenshots nun? Papadala, papadala po namin. Oh, ganito, huwag na natin bagitin yung mga pangalan na yan kasi baka sabihin si single out. Okay? But the point is ganito, kasi si Miss Varona, I'm sure, kayo, you're for freedom of expression. Okay? So, kunwari ako netizen. No, I, I really, I honestly want to know this, ha? And Miss Banago, also, you, you help me here. Outlet ko na nga yung internet, eh. Galit ako sa mundo, eh. Okay? Karapatan ko sabihin, I'm mad, you know, I'm I'm upset. But where will my freedom extend to the point where it becomes already a violation or, um, let's say, uh, a disrespect to somebody else, uh, disrespect on somebody else's rights? Okay, so tell me, to what extent should it be? Um, makaluma ba tayo? Nasabihin na limbawa, yung sinabi ni Tonyo na, oh, Bawal tayo magsabi ng ganito tungkol sa mga babae. Bawal tayo mag ano. Kasi, alam mo ako, galing rin akong showbiz, no? Uh, masaya rin na may outlet, eh. Hoy, ganyan-ganyan. Pero, kahit naman sa masayang ganon, may limitasyon din. Hindi, hindi ka rin magte-threaten or mag ano. So, ma'am, paano ba yon? Does it curtail our freedom to express when we want to say, I hate the world and I just want you all to die? I want to, I mean, how? Tell me. Um, thank you, ma'am. Um, when, when somebody says, you know, I hate the world and I hope everybody, you know, dies, that's, ano yan eh, hugot sa hangin yan. The dangerous thing is when these um, messages of hate, especially, and I, I have I have pretty much a regular recipient of this, when they say, sana ma-rape yung anak mo para maano mo, uh, para malaman mo, parang ano, parang di ba, sana maano kayo ng drug addict, uh, marami pa yan eh um, what else do they know but all, all the major outfits will have very clear standards of behavior both on their websites and on the Facebook page I know I, know, I, I used to have BMPM and it had very clear guidelines there, ang bawal ho ay you do not threaten anybody period, for whatever reason, period threats are not allowed. And everybody from whether it's inquire or uh, no, are very clear and very determined to crack down on threats because you never know when a person who threatens online will take it on ground. No? Um, you can't, you can and not, and to ignore these threats, because these are real threats, and there are laws that actually penalize these threats, um, would be to encourage more abuse. No? So personally, on my Facebook page, I don't mind when people criticize me. But when my friends attack a person, even those who may agree with my sentiments, attack somebody in a very personal, very um, hateful way, even without threats, I will take them down. Very clear, yan, eh. I always say, I don't care uh, ano, um, which side you represent. As long as you, can, you show abusive behavior on my page, you're out of here. And I think most news organizations follow that. And I really do hope that government, official government accounts should follow that. Totoo yung sabi ni Tonyo, mahirap po, isa-isa eh. Minsan, kasi when I opened, one time I opened, ano, I had 300 messages, nag-aaway ng mga tao, natulog lang ako ng dalawang oras, Nag nagbabangayan na yung mga tao, nag na. So it's tiring. But I think if there's anything that the government ought to invest in, it's to ensure that their pages, that on their pages, people act with decent behavior. You know, the head of PCO, I know, uh, Mr. Andanar is a very decent person. I mean, you, you see his demeanor, okay? I'm sure you're frustrated too. So between both of you, uh, what can you do to ensure also? I mean, I mean comments, maraming hugot yung ating mga kababayan eh. Pero, paano po, sir? As much as possible po, Madam Chair. 
and uh, ideally I would want to hire the maximum amount of people who can answer all of the questions that are uh, thrown or sent on our Facebook account with 1.3 million followers. There was one time also that we uh, started deleting comments. Uh, this was in the early 2016 of the administration. Tapos sinabihan naman kami, ba't nyo inaalis yung mga comment? Paano yung freedom of expression namin? So, damn if you do, damn if you don't. So, ang ginawa po namin, Madam Chair, kung sino mag-comment, whether it's for or against the administration, sige, comment lang kayo ng comment. Kasi, total, ang administration ito na iniwala naman sa freedom of expression. But let me just tell the body, Madam Chair, that of course, I, I am one with everyone here who is against uh, hate speech. Ayaw ko rin ho ng hate speech. Ako, I am a victim of hate speech. Pero sabi nga nila, eh, kailangan hindi ka balat si Buyas pag ikaw ay nasa gobyerno, kaya hindi ko nalang pinapansin. Now, if Tonyo can give me a very good solution and perhaps uh, can sit down with me in the office so we can uh, point by point maybe a study the numbers, the budget of PCOO at tulungan niya ako para makakuha kami ng uh, no, okay pero sec Martin, hindi ninyo tinatanggal ngayon? Hindi namin tinatanggal, ma'am. Alam mo, sir, Lala, lahat, oh. hindi, pwede naman yung sabihin. Okay, libre naman kayong mag-express ng sarili ng ng pananaw ninyo, pero wa wala nga mga threat na gano'n, na i-rape kita o gano'n-gano'n. Yung mga gano'n, sa tingin ko naman, grave threat na yun, kahit sa batas natin, medyo mali na yun. But, um, so kahit magalit pa sila sa'yo, eh, baka basto sila para magsabi ng gano'n. And first of all, um, uh, kahit naman yung mga vloggers natin, ha, na mga magagaling, hindi naman sila ganyan din magbanta. Di ba? Use your intellect to be able to criticize, to be able to express yourself. Don't, don't, don't take that, uh, what do you call this? A very indecent and um, dehumanizing uh, way of expressing. Uh, Tonya, you were going to comment on this since you were, your name was cited. Madam Chair, siguro, baka pwede na lang natin tanongin yung Facebook because the Philippines is not the only country in the world that uses Facebook and the Philippine government is not the only government that uses Facebook. I'm sure there are many other best practices of other governments regarding the use of Facebook, regarding uh, limiting or stomping out hate speech and prohibited speech. Uh, are there any experiences of Facebook working with other governments? Uh, would they have suggestions on which countries to look at so that the PCOO could study? Oh, alam ko that Facebook has an agreement with the European Union, right? Any hate speech, anti-racial um, uh, speech, anti-race, uh, anti-race speeches, these things are frowned upon and, in fact, violative in in those countries in the EU. Am I correct? Uh, you are um, actually along with Google, and it'd be great to hear from our colleague at Google again. I think because we feel that we're, we're dominating. Um, we, we with them and other companies have signed the EU Code of Conduct on Hate Speech, um, which is uh, principally around ensuring that we get better at um, addressing reports of hate speech, uh, that we are more effective in doing that and more accurate in doing it. Um, we signed that roughly two years ago. And since then, there have been three different tests of how well we are doing. The most recent was reported, if I recall, in December. And it showed that all the platforms, uh, but I, I, I would hesitate, slightly hesitate to say, but particularly Facebook, had got a lot better at addressing this issue. This is, however, clearly based on, on reported hate speech. It's not about the issue that uh, has been raised around uh, how governments moderate their own pages. We provide moderation tools as part of the training that we provide to um, not just to governments but uh, other organizations including companies uh, when it comes to the use of their pages. We explain how those moderation tools work but it really is up to uh, the administrators of those pages to determine whether or not they may want to make use of those moderation tools. Is there anything you want to add? What about Google? 
Ma'am, you are raising your hands. And then GMA 7, ha? Hindi ko pa kayo naririnig. Siguro GMA muna. Tapos kayo, ma'am, sa si CNN. GMA. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, I'd just like to share our experiences uh, with Facebook, especially given the, the recent changes um, uh, in its uh, algorithm. Uh, in January, uh, they announced that they were de-emphasizing posts from pages and um, emphasizing posts from personal accounts and communities. Uh, so if you noticed over the past uh, few weeks, you're, if you've been checking Facebook, uh, you're seeing less news on your site, uh, on, on your feed, and less uh, posts from pages that you like. Uh, the idea is that uh, it will emphasize posts from friends, pictures, etc. Uh, but there's a caveat there in that uh, the reach for paid uh, posts isn't reduced. Uh, what we're seeing and what uh, personally my friends who work in, in social media management are seeing is that uh, Facebook is turning out to be more and more of a pay-to-play platform. So if you want your post to be seen, and if you're an organization, you have to advertise with Do you have you have an idea how much? Uh, Let's say for uh, 100,000 views. Uh, it, it's, it's very interesting. It depends. It, uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's an auction uh, in that you can target uh, it, it's an automated auction in that you can target uh, specific groups. For example, people in Makati, you can target uh, if you have a business that uh, that that. How much do you business. spend? Uh, we 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 GMA, for example, uh, GMA News uh, spends a minuscule amount just to test uh, the effects. So, so minuscule meaning how much? Uh, it's two thousand pesos a week. Pero uh, marami kayong reach nun. Ah, uh, hindi ma'am. Ah, uh, talagang tinitingnan lang namin for study yung effect So, 2,000 pesos mga ilan. Kasi ako, marami ako nakukuha from Jessica So very interesting uh, links. Okay, yes. I don't know if this is her personal effort or this is GMA, but let's say 2,000 pesos. How much, how many exposures does, does that get you? That's about uh, probably 5,000 new followers. Kasi kunyari ah, Ako sa atin dito may uh, 3 million na uh, likes, no? Pero yung 3 million na yun, parang ang konti-konti lang nang nakaka-respond. Yes. Napansin ko noon, yung mga likes natin, ilang libo, tapos biglang nagiging 300 na lang on yes. a regular basis or hmm. 500. So the engagement is lower. Anyway, um, so just direct your question. Sorry, ma'am, uh, uh, kukwento ko lang. Kasi um, in the U.S., for example, um, the, the ads actually were what uh, the fake news um, uh, purveyors used to target uh, particular groups uh, during the elections, yung Russian ads. Uh, basically, they paid Facebook to place those ads and targeted particular groups who would be likely to share fake okay, news. Okay, so what's your question, uh, Mr. Tordesilla? Yes, ma'am. Ang ano ko lang, uh, given that magkaka-election sa atin, uh, and, uh, Kasi competition ay Facebook sa GMA. <laughs> hindi lang yun, ma'am. Um, kami nagko-comply, for example. Diba? Oh, oh, oh. Uh, we do reporting on election spending, how many people uh, uh, place advertisements for us. Um, I don't think Facebook does that. And perhaps that's something the committee can look into, into that kind of regulation. And also reporting. Um, we don't know how... We don't know, for example, if we see a fake ad or uh, on our feed, we can't compel Facebook for now to, to tell us who plays that. We, for all we know, it could be a foreign actor, uh, it could be a, an operative, it can be an official of the campaign. So, so there's no transparency there. No, 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 I, I see your point. And thank you for making that, uh, for, for voicing out that observation. Number one. We're here for the free market of ideas. Okay, labas. But whatever's do the Philippines. Diba? I mean, all of you are compliant as uh, registered media companies in the Philippines. So if there's something that we can, um, that we rightfully uh, deserve, let's say in terms of compensation, taxes or whatever, 
Your body should be compliant. Diba? Yes. Ilabas mo kung ano yung gusto mo ilabas, pero bayaran mo naman din kami yes, na, na ayon sa batas. Ang oh. problema, sasabihin ko na sa iyo ngayon, hindi ang kakulangan sa atin. Eh. Wala pa tayong yeah, batas dyan sa mga ganyan. Eh, ayaw naman natin basta maghimasok lang dyan. Hmm. But I see your concern. Yeah, and actually, yeah, ma'am, how I'll, do you monitor it? Yeah, let me just share in Indonesia and Malaysia, for example, they're also studying introducing legislation about fake news and part of it is uh, taxing uh, Google and Facebook to so that there there will be that trail uh, of 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 uh, that basically you can run after the the people who who place ads if, if okay well fake. I appreciate your inputs and your concerns about this is certainly something that uh, we would be remiss if we didn't study because everybody who benefits also from our consumers our public should have uh, their contribution mm. in the national economy um, DICT, and then I'd like to hear from uh, Ms. Angeles. Buti nakahabol ka pa, attorney. Bibigyan mo kami ng inputs dito, ha? Because we want a balanced hearing. But I want, um, DICT, sir, what are you doing? Uh, magandang hapon po sa inyo lahat. Uh, I've been taking notes, and I would like to address some of the concerns. Uh, although DICT, pag pinag-uusapan natin ng technology, hindi lang naman ho technology ang ating ginagawa because as far as we are concerned, the policy is to ensure that uh, ICT is being utilized for nation building. Now, tungkol dito sa fake news, uh, the issue actually is whether or not uh, a legislation is required to uh, for purposes of uh, stopping the spread of fake news. Bago ko po sagutin yun, una-una, tama po yung sinasabi ni Madam Chair na ang meron lamang batas ay yung Republic, uh, ah, I'm sorry, Revised Penal Code Article 154 against false news. Pero meron ding mga kaakibat na batas which under the, uh, meron niyang Republic Act 6713, Code of Conduct and Ethical Standards for Public Officials Employees, you have Article 19, 20, and 21 of the New Civil Code uh, with respect to the duty to act with honesty and good faith and make, making uh, the offender responsible for damages. And uh, we also have Article 355 of the Revised Penal Code on libel, so on and so forth. Now, second, Madam Chair, um, on the matter of uh, defining fake news, uh, definitely, as far as the department is concerned, uh, wala pa hong nakikitang definition dyan. But uh, more or less, based on consultations which were conducted, uh, pwede ho nating i-define yan as a deliberate and willful posting, distribution, and sharing of an untruthful statement or false or malicious information through electric electronic communication such as but not limited to social media, uh, email, e-groups, among others. On the matter of uh, uh, the concern raised by Mr. Cruz tungkol sa mga government officials and employees, uh, the good news is that as early as last year, uh, we in government, uh, the ICT with PCOO, uh, Civil Service Commission, the SWD, and the uh, SES Board, Career Executive Service Board, have already met several times, and we have uh, we came up with a draft administrative order, and this draft um, circulated to Naminyan, and it was published in our website, and pumunta kami sa iba't ibang lugar sa buong bansa. Uh, and we conducted consultations with uh, the government officials, government employees, or rather, yes, government offices. And so far, um, we are almost done with our work. And ang mangyayari po dito is this. Government will only have one official social media account. But they can also come up with a social media account, uh, say, on a specific uh, department or program. But all of this will have to be approved by the head of agency. There will be a social media team 
which will manage the social media account. Ngayon, anong mangyayari doon sa mga existing uh, social media account na mga iba't ibang government uh, officials or employees? They are not official. They are unauthorized and therefore, if ever they are using it, for purposes of disseminating information uh, regarding government projects or even opinion, they have to delete that. Okay. Merong coming rules na ginawa doon on how that could be made possible. Next. Yan yung contents. Um, nung mga social media accounts ng gobyerno, dapat official sa, they could contain yung mga publications and then materials. Merong mga blacklisted uh, sabi nating uh, actions or hindi pwede like blackmailing, insultive contents, pornographic materials, malicious uh, contents, uh, mga untruthful uh, statements, uh, so on and so forth. Medyo marami po yan. And that, uh, in other words, what we're trying to do here is to make the civil servants responsible enough to handle social media or how to uh, for them to engage in social media and they can also maintain personal account wala hong problema ron but it has to be very responsive yung kanyang account na yan and if ever it will be used in her his or her personal capacity uh, that is his or her own lookout she wait, should wait, remember wait, wait, wait sir okay okay uh -huh. Uh, so, of course, yes. we can have our own uh, blog, no? our, our own site, but our own lookout, please expound. Expound on it. Diba? As government officials, we can have our own, but you said it is our own lookout. Please uh, expound on that. Uh, okay. As far as the civil servant is concerned, uh, Madam Chair, meaning to say, you have several laws uh, in place uh, which could be utilize uh, if in case there are violations as he or she can be held liable like yung 6713 nga po we have the privacy act we have the intellectual property law and then revised penal code the new civil code uh, sunod sunod na po yun, so sa revised penal code meron na talaga dyan na nakasaad na yes, disinformation di ba po at mm. saka misinformation fake news Yung Basically, false news. Madam Chair. Diba po? Meron uh -huh. na, diba? Yes, Madam Chair. Meron na po yun. And in fact, uh, the President has uh, uh, signed an amendment to it with respect to the penalties nito sa 154 that was last year. The President signed on to it? Uh, President Duterte, Your Honor. Oh, what that did was he? 2017. Ano yung sinign on yan? Um, ano yung penalties, sir? So even the President supports uh, That's uh, Republic Act 10951. Signed on August 29, 2017, amending Article 154, Section 18 of the Revised Penal Code. Uh, meron pong imprisonment of uh, six months and then increasing the penalty to 200,000 pesos. So the President recently updated this. He signed on to it, an amendment. Ay, yes. Ito na po yung... Ano. So yung 1095 po is just increasing penalty. Yun po yung amendment sa so, uh, Revised Penal Code 194. Uh, you were saying that the president has a republic. No, the president has um, amended. No, Your Honor, there was a Republic Act 10951. Okay. Uh, and this was passed August 29, 2017. Okay, 10951 then, states that. Yes, 10951, amending Article 154, Section 18. What particular um, provision was amended, sir? Ayan. Mm -hmm. Ito. Um, ito na yan. Yeah, uh, increasing the penalty to arresto mayor and a fine ranging from 40,000 to 200,000. So lahat, basically, yan yung omnibus penalties ng RPC. So lahat yan, kasama yung 19... 194. 154. 154. 154. 154. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's Senator Drillon's um, amendment. Okay. So, sir, I think um, 
I would like to give you, I, I appreciate the time, but I think I, I, I want to ask uh, Eagle Broadcasting your thoughts on the matter, please, ma'am. Good afternoon, ma'am, and thank you for inviting us in this uh, hearing. Uh, for Eagle Broadcasting Corporation, just like any other uh, network, uh, we have in place uh, our uh, fact-checking uh, system, and uh, we have uh, our uh, correspondents that are uh, checking uh, uh, the perspectives, perspe perspectives on the ground. And uh, we, uh, just like other network, we also uh, uh, counter check with the uh, people involved uh, if the information uh, was out and uh, we are actually personally I was a journalist uh, I, I am not com comfortable uh, with uh, the term fake news because uh, fake and news cannot be uh, put together because uh, I think this was uh, the opinion of Mr. De Silias. It's kind of an irony, the right? yes. contradictory. It's yeah, I know, but it's just a term. It's just a, it's just a popular term. I, I see your concern. Okay. Yes, ma'am. And uh, uh, with the use of the social media right now, uh, um, we are concerned that uh, there are some institutions uh, using the social media to influence people uh, because that is one of the objectives of the social media. And uh, uh, in the coming, uh, actually there are instances that uh, some institutions, personalities uh, manipulate the information. So uh, with the disinformation and the uh, um, maneuvering of information uh, is actually uh, for us, for me, uh, is actually uh, disabling uh, the uh, uh, informed choice of the people. So uh, right now, uh, we are really uh, very, very uh, careful with the information we are sharing with the people, the public, and uh, uh, we are uh, all um, adhering for uh, responsible journalism. Thank you, ma'am. Um, actually, when when you were mentioning about um, your hesitance to define what fake news is, I agree. I mean, you, you would really have your reservations because it can backfire. But I think that Ms. Sor uh, Ms. Soriano has made a point here that what fake news is really with the intent or the malice to deceive, correct? I mean, um, it could be... Um, if it, if it was just an innocent mistake, I mean, iba yon. Pero kung talagang intention mo yung mangloko, yun talaga yon. Hindi na yun news, ay yung inventong story na yon. Yes. So, um, but, um, I, because actually we're supposed to adjourn already soon, but I want to hear Attorney Trixie. Kasi Attorney ganito yan. Ito yung napag-discussion na namin ng wala ka eh. Papakatutuo tayo. Okay. Unang-una, um, ang sinasabi sa diskusyon natin, dapat may kalayaan ng lahat na maghayag, di ba? Pero kayo rin ay abogado at saka bilang isang babae rin, minsan, nagiging bastos rin yung iba. Kunyari, rapein kita, ganun-ganon. Hindi din naman natin, hindi din naman maganda yan sa ating lipunan. Um, pangalawa, nung pumunta kasi dito yung na, nagsalita rin si, um, si Secretary Roque, uh, yung kanyang concern na masyado tayo mag magre-regulate lalong-lalo na mayroong diskriminasyon para dun sa mga miyembro ng gobyerno um, kung masihigpitan natin ang standards sa kanila. Pero ako naman, and I, pangangat, pangangatayuan ko to, lalo na ako ay nasa gobyerno, mas mahirapan ako dito, mas mataas ang standard dapat sa amin. Okay? Kami nga yung nagre-report ng salin, yung Chief Justice natin, pwedeng matanggal dahil dun sa salin na yan, Kayo ba pag individual na privado, eh, kailangan ninyo mag-submit ng salin? Hindi naman. So, yun yung mga concerns natin. So, Attorney Trixie, kayo, matagal na kayo nakikipaglaban para sa karapatan ng kababaihan, para sa karapatan ng uh, malayang pamamahayag. Ano, ano ang inyong opinion? Pagdating dito sa kalayaan natin na magsalita, anong hangganan nito, Attorney? Um, as you said, ang, the rule is freedom of speech. The restrictions must be set either by the Constitution or laws that adhere to the Constitution. Meron tayo, dahil nagbabago ang mga media platforms natin, bumibilis 
yung information, bumibilis yung ability natin to manipulate that information, and there is increasing anonymity. Ngayon, meron tayong mga batas, may 154, may libel, etc. Pero the problem now is bridging the gap between the law enforcement and the, the crime itself. For example, if somebody libels me on Facebook and I want to file a case against him or her, I can't because I don't have an address. Or it's a fake account. Or it's somebody I, you know, even if it's somebody I don't know, I cannot locate them. Or they're located in a different jurisdiction. So I have no uh, recourse. Sometimes, depending on the standards that are set by, let's say, Facebook, I will not even be able to take down that speech. Okay, so the, the primary concern, I think, on both parties, whether it's uh, the pro or uh, administration or the anti-administration, the question is, what do we do when somebody does us wrong? And that wrong constitutes particular speech. So uh, for public officers, accountability is easy because of the code of ethics and the fact that they can be located. All you have to do is file your case, give the addresses their office, it gets served. No problem. In fact, I think that public officers are the least of our concerns because we can bridge the gap very easily. The problem is the rest of the public. Uh, I understand uh, Mr. Cruz's concern about hate speech, but that's another thing. There's no definition of hate speech in anywhere in our law, so they might want to look at that. Um, Hate speech is defined under common usage as uh, a, an aggressive speech directed at a particular aggrupation of people, whether they're defined by race, religion, uh, or uh, nationality. Yes. Uh, here, originally, I, th I was thinking that baka naman, wala naman kasing hate speech dito. Meron uh, aggressive speech, threatening speech, libelous speech, etc. But with the evolution of the Duterteards and the Yellows, suddenly, it's possible that we actually do have hate speech now. Yeah, sorry, yellow tards. Yes, actually. The, so so the, the polarization of communications on social media platforms have led to, to this sort of thing. So I think that in the end, because the, the internet is still considered such a wild, wild west, it's, they're, they're very, even if we have rules, the, the ability to be able to enforce those rules still de de is determined largely by the platform. By the, by, the, by the people who, who make that uh, platform possible. In this case, it would be Facebook or Twitter or whatever else it is. So I think that the, the target for legislation here is to be able to make sure that as much as the laws we make are, are good and have uh, really good intentions, how do we enforce them? Considering that, uh, for instance, Facebook doesn't ask for us for addresses. If, if somebody libels me, somebody threatens to kill me, how do I go? The NBI has to have recourse to be able to locate that. But in order to do that, they may have to contend with the Data Privacy Act. So now what do you do? But there's, there's no way you can, you can do that. And then if in cases like, uh, like I have to mention this, Thinking Pinoy, just gathering information that is readily available on the net and suddenly he's liable for a violation of the Data Privacy Act, but the, the, the enforcement of these particular laws has suddenly entered into vagueness. What we're saying here is that this is, new, this is a new area. We don't know what we're, we're doing for most of the part when it comes to enforcement of the laws. No, but, but I agree with you, Attorney. Yeah. Parang hate speech is not really defined. It's not. We need and to have a law. Oh, aggressive hate speech. speech. I mean, uh, yes. kunyari, a grave threat, di ba? Yes. May mga ganyan. I mean, kayo abogado, ako hindi. But, pero, ma matanong, matanong lang kita, no? Um, kasi sinasabi nga ni Tonyo, di ba sinabi mo, you, you sympathize with him, you agree. Eh kasi nga, sa ibang platform, halimbawa, hindi nilalabas yung, nyari, re-rapin kita, papatayin kita, ganyan. Ikaw ba sa tingin mo, dun sa mga comments na yon, kung may kapabilidad naman, dapat tanggalin yon. Uh, of course. There it, uh, but it all also depend on the standard set by the provider, by the platform. So, Again, Facebook has community standards. If they violate the communi community standards, you can report it, but the discretion is theirs to take down or not. So, it, and th that discretion is not even determined by what our laws are. But it, it can be kayo, attorney, anything. Kasi kayo, ko yung blog ninyo, no? It's very um, objective. I mean, well, of course, you have your own leanings. I mean, if, that's why it's a blog. You have your own personal leanings. But you don't use um, defamatory, di ba? I mean, as much as possible, you try to stick to the issues. Okay. 
Would you suggest, for example, that especially a government platform, if they have the capability, they should take out those that are a little bit, uh, well, uh, threatening already, and di ba? Parang of course, and I think that can be done with technology. There are certain keywords that you can watch out for, so you don't need people to actually monitor your comment sections. So, yes, I think attorney that this can Mar be done. I mean, attorney, naging attorney ka tuloy. Sec, <laughs> Sec Martin already Sec Martin has, because uh, no, he's really good at this. Marie, uh, attorney Banag, tanggalin na ninyo yan. Kasi alam mo, syempre, di ba, pag sinasabi rape, uh, mamatay na yung pamilya mo, mga ganon, there's no room for that in our society. I think we have to encourage like a higher level of debate. Di ba, parang yung katamaran na yun eh, or pagiging, actually, kabastusan na yun. So, um, ako naman kasi, sabihin nyo lahat how frustrated you are. Like, ay, ikaw, palpa ka sa trabaho mo, ganito, ganyan, okay? Um, in fact, ako nga, something that you cannot do anything about your physical well-being, dapat hindi din kasama yan, but okay, sabihin na natin, okay, wala, parang ayoko yung itsura mo, ganyan, okay, fine na yun. Pero, yung talagang threatening, pati dun sa mga anak mo, or dun sa pamilya, parang wala na yun. Okay, Miss Varona. Very briefly lang po. Um, while I will hold Facebook accountable example, if I report something that it doesn't act on and it's clearly a threat, um, I wouldn't push on Facebook the entire um, you know, responsibility of overseeing our pages. I mean, all the news organizations have pages that they, where the comments are regulated, not because we hate freedom of speech, but because we recognize that people cannot just be allowed to threaten other people. And it's not like they have 200 um, people watching over their Facebook accounts, Secretary Andanarpo, um, 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 Senator Grace. They have very few, ano, pinakamarami na po na mga 15 personnel ang mga citizen journalist outfits ng iba't ibang company. But yet, they managed to do that. And I think it's really the responsibility of the government agencies that owns the Facebook account or whatever account there is to monitor it. And let's not talk of um, mechanical algorithms. It's really the world view of the people who own that page. Do you think threats are okay in this society? Or do you think that threats are a crime and should never be allowed in government um, estate? No, th thank you, ma'am. I think that, um, no, th no, that's right. Okay, uh, Facebook, I'm sure you have the capability. And uh, we're not putting all the blame uh, in you. In fact, we appreciate, uh, we, we have our own pages, okay, obviously. So we're, there are people who are taking advantage. But we have to be able to monitor our sites also. Um, Somebody, Secretary Andanar, yes, sir. Uh, yes, Madam Chair. Uh, number one, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I am against hate speech or any aggressive speech that, that hurt people. Um, number two, I am also totally against censorship. Ayoko hong maakusahan as the Secretary of the PCOO na kapag inaalis natin ay sinesensor ko because that happened before already, as I mentioned earlier. Number three, kung meron pong magre-reklamo, kung meron pong mag makapag-screenshot at ipadala sa opisina ho namin, tanggapan namin, then we will remove. Uh, so far, wala pa akong nagko-complain. Number Ay, ako, alam mo, attorney Banag, ikaw na Apo. ang mag-monitor dun sa mga ganyan. <laughs> and then, and then ma'am, number four, uh, Ito hong mga hate speech, ito hong mga slanderous na comments, this could also serve as proof kapag kinasuhan mo yung taong uh, nagsulat. So, siguro, Attorney Trixie, yeah, we can, we can uh, discuss this in our office. Thank you. But you know what, Attorney Trixie, I, I really appreciate those blogs, huh? I mean, of information. I don't agree with you all the time. But when you stick to the issues, and then uh, you encourage people to contribute, but on a level that is respectable. Kasi parang, parang sa akin, kung ganyan na lang, bastusan na lang ba tayo? Ba't pa tayo nagkaroon ng lipunan, di ba? Parang, um, I, I am not for, hindi ako nagmamalines, but I, I hope that, um, okay, I'll ask you this. 
because you're, you're kind of in between. Okay. This is not in my committee, but I believe that government officials to be held at, uh, should be held at a higher standard. Okay. Secretary Roque, and I, I respect where he's coming from. He's saying that, in there, that's discrimination, okay? Although this is from a different uh, uh, committee, uh, discrimination, because why will you give uh, government officials uh, more of a penalty for violating the same crime? Because it's already in our revised penal code 154, am I correct? Na parang false news, okay? Ako naman, ang sinasabi ko dito, government employees, and I belong to, to that, huh? Um, we should be held at a higher standard, kaya there should be administrative responsibilities then. Ibig sabihin, pag meron kang violation, hindi lamang criminal, which can take years, pwede ka muna isuspend sa trabaho mo. Okay. Sinasabi niya, hindi, that, that's a prejudice. Ngayon lang niya sinasabi yon, Because I believe, kami nga sa gobyerno, we have to submit our salin, you have to submit your salin. We have to be able to answer to a plunder case or a uh, a graft case, and the private individual is not subject to the same unless they connive with a government official. Your take on that, ma'am? Um, like Secretary Andanar, I believe that the freedom of speech is the rule. Uh, and in also, in all cases, that prior restraint is wrong. So now it becomes a question of how you are going to judge particular speech if it is uttered by a public officer. If that, the, their code of ethics, as, as we all know, but the question of standards is something that we should be more specific in because you're going to be holding a person accountable and the possibility of losing their jobs is always real. So uh, that is where we stand now. The, my problem is that the standards are very quickly changing because of social media. The, the explosion in social media from 2015 to the present time has been, you know, geometric so pegging a particular standard at this point when everything is in flux might be difficult for example there was a time when there was no social media so it was easy to judge the demeanor and behavior of a public officer and where their demeanor and behavior becomes accountable to their but becomes you know creditable to their position for example judges justices even socializations are, are subject to close scrutiny but if you are, let's say, a uh, uh, clerk, rank and file in government, how much leeway are you going to give that person? Now with social media, there is the freedom of expression, there is the, uh, the prohibition against prior restraint, and just how much can you say on a personal account in your own personal time when you're talking about uh, a government employee or officer whose demeanor or behavior is not subject to the same kind of scrutiny as a judge or a justice. So now the problem is standards. So it, it's difficult to make a law when you have different standards for different kinds of public officials. No, no, no. I, I'm with you there. I mean, uh, we don't want to overregulate, but that's what we're saying. But I think that there are certain um, things that are obvious. For example, um, there are gray areas, for sure. But let's say a government official is irresponsible enough to say na aapaw ang dam na alam mo naman talagang hindi. Di ba? Nanakot lang. Yun talaga, for sure, accountable. Um, uh, ayoko magbanggit ng pangalan na kasi sabi nila sinisingle out. Pero, kunyari, opinion nung mga ano, dapat din nag-iingat na may kuwanting paggalang. But, but I know what you're saying. Um, you didn't really answer definitively. Should we, should we, should we be held liable in that? No, because nga, you cannot really define that standard. Okay, um, but I I don't think it will be. I don't think that we're worse off if we have government officials that are more cautious. I mean, that's just my take, and I I feel that I can speak uh, with authority on this precisely because I will be affected by it. I am part of it. Okay. When I speak and I criticize not just uh, any particular party, but my, my colleague, as long as it's factual and it's not malicious, it's not something that I invent, like let's say my seatmate, uh, Senator Laxon, did this and this, which is not naman true. Yun talaga for sure. But if it's something based on, on a legitimate criticism of something that occurred, I don't think that... Um, I think that's pretty clear that, that that's an opinion. 
Anyway, uh, attorney ako pa. Ano na na pinalusot ko sa MTRCB na minsan nga nagsisisi rin ako. But my point is, of course we would rather have uh, the freedom to express. But sometimes, as, as, a, as a, an individual, as a Filipino, I don't think that we're worse off maintaining a certain level of standard and respect also. Diba? Parang, eh kayo nga dyan sa, madali kayo eh, kasi media entity kayo eh. Pwede kayong paalisin sa trabaho nyo anytime. If you violate, um, if you print something that is naturally false. But if you're your own boss, you're, uh, ano, it will be more difficult. But I think for the government, I know Secretary Martin and Secretary Banag, they're trying to maintain a certain standard. There's, there are others that are a little bit uh, stubborn. I, I know the challenge, but let's just, um, I think that we have the capability naman to see kung talagang grave threat na yan. Diba? Kahit naman si Attorney Trixie, alam naman niya, abogado siya eh. Diba? Medyo may pambabastos na yan. Babae rin yan, kahit pa paano, lalabas rin yan. Um, but we, I myself, I don't want to over-legislate. And Facebook and uh, Google, we appreciate your presence in our country to be able to bridge um, the gaps among friends, long-lost lovers, I don't know. But, <laughs> but, my, but my point is also give us a little bit of... Uh, importance. I think that um, it's not too much to ask. I'm, I'm not for overtaxing anybody. I want free competition in this country. I'm more, I want more investors for our country, but I also want our country to get um, what we believe um, is due us. Okay, so right now it's not your fault. This is how it is, but send a representative that we can easily communicate with. Okay, um, before I wrap up, any more comments? Sir, I haven't heard from you. Mr. Hernandez? No, what's your name? Uh, Clavite, Harold Clavite. I can't so, see Sir, Philippine name. Information Agency. Po. Okay, very quickly. Sir, what do you have to add? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you, ma Madam Chair. Uh, just to add uh, context on the discussions, I'd like to emphasize also that uh, since we're talking about responsibility and accountability here, I'd like to point out that I, I very much agree uh, with the other resource persons that this is not just the sole responsibility of one entity. Uh, we cannot put the blame to Facebook. We cannot put on the blame to uh, government as well. Uh, but uh, in the whole scheme of things, this is everyone's uh, responsibility and accountability. And I'd like to commend uh, this committee for uh, giving such a forum for us to have the opportunity to talk about this. Because for me, it's very important that we talk about this because this is a very uh, important and real issue. Now, uh, on the part of the government, I'd like to assure you that um, um, systems, I mean, uh, policies have been, uh, been, been trying to put into order these things. As far as government offices are concerned, um, as reported earlier by DICT and PCOO, um, the, administrative, the draft administrative order on social media use in government is on its uh, final stages and soon we will have those guidelines and I think this will help um, offices, government officials in the conduct of and use of social media. Are you working with PCO? Yes, that? madam. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, let me ask um, KBP, sir, you have any manifestations? Uh, thank you, madam chair, for inviting KBP again. Uh, on fake news in broadcast and on television, if there is any outfit that has benefited out of uh, fake news, it's probably the broadcast industry and traditional media because then we have become more relevant. Uh, kami ang pinupuntahan kung meron balita na alanganin, kami ang tinatanong kung tama o hindi. So, naging mas relevant ang traditional media sa paglaganap uh, ng quote-unquote fake news. Uh, of course, we follow the same traditions and uh, principles of verification as pointed out a while ago. That is inherent in the practice of responsible journalism. Uh, that is not to say that we do not absolutely, uh, rather, that is not to say, however, that we do not uh, give 
unverified information sometimes. Even our ethical practices allow the, uh, the broadcast of unverified information if under certain circumstances, the withholding of the same might cause more harm. Ang example nyo kanina po, uh, pumuputok yung dam. Pwede pong nakareceive kami ng information na nag umaapaw na ang dam at napaka-important ang ipaalam sa downstream. Pero hindi pa namin ma-verify. We can give the information but label it as unverified information. And there are guidelines that we should follow like verifying it ASAP and correcting it as soon as possible. So may, meron po instances na gumagamit o nabibigay ang unverified information. Uh, but the rule is still at least two verified, credible verifications rather. Uh, sa punto ng protected speech, ang KBP ang isang institusyon na talagang pinapaglaban namin ang freedom of expression. Pero siguro, important rin na i-distinguish na meron certain levels of protected speech. Political speech is the highest of all protected speech. At talagang unconstitutional kung maglalabas uh, tayo ng batas na uh, i-restrain uh, ito. Pero meron ibang klaseng speech. Hate speech is one. Uh, commercial speech is one. Meron qualifications in, uh, in uh, legislating against them or, or controlling them. So pwede po yun. Huwag lang yung political speech. At the, and the, uh, the parameters, the guidelines, the distinction should be very clear. As to yung punto po ng government officials being subject to certain rules, uh, na, tama po yung equal protection. Pero the term itself defines it, equal protection. Under equal circumstances are the class distinguished. And there is a distinction between a private individual and a government official. That's found in the Constitution. It says government officials or the government is a public trust. Magkaiba yun. Ang private individual, hindi ganun ang one. So, equal protection refers to all things being equal. So, uh, hindi necessary na hindi pwedeng i-regulate. Although one compromise is what was pointed out kanina, na uh, the government agencies should be mandated to have a very clear social media policy. Uh, and that should be part of their transparency and uh, the public charter na dapat alam ng mga kababaan ng uh, madla na meron social media policy at eto yung mga rules ng social media policy. That would not be infringing upon the right of public officials. So, yun po ang input namin, uh, Madam Chair. Maraming salamat po. Magaling talaga kayo, Attorney Waralvan. Matagal ko ng um, informal advisor ito. Eh. Matagal na talagang, hindi lang ako ha, marami na sa atin na uh, talagang napailalim dyan sa KBP, na meron silang ethical standards. And, and then I, I, you know, I would like to wrap up this hearing. The chair noted that SB 1680 is referred to the Committee on Civil Service and that a higher accountability is demanded from government officials and employees consistent with the action that the public office is a public trust as you mentioned. It's a choice for us. Eh? We want to run for public office. We give up certain privileges. Um, we are appointed. We give up certain things. The chair shared the sentiment uh, the communications and free expression should not be hindered. Um, on the other hand, uh, well, number two, Facebook said that they care about the issue at hand, alarmed on fake news. Facebook admitted that fake news issue is more nuanced and more difficult than terrorism. And I agree, because it's, it's not very clear sometimes that Facebook is committed to build an informed community in four approaches, stopping bad actors in using Facebook. We've seen that in other countries. Disrupting economic um, incentives, news feed ranking, and empowering communities and partners. Number four, Facebook is committed to promote public education, addressing bullying, respect for privacy and others. 
Facebook has been working in partnership with various media student organizations and schools and universities. You've mentioned that you, worked all, you work also with the DICT. Google said that contents are important to them and that they worked with various news stations and worked with journalists with Cebu Sun, Sunstar as the last. Google follows an algorithm for one issue, personality, to get to the top for hits or visits. Facebook said that they have been working with the government, uh, like the DICT mainly, seven from the mainstream media, CNN and ABS-CBN, uh, even uh, GMA, a suggestion, although not a definition, that fake news is not validated uh, from sor Fake news is one not validated from one source and are not checked and rechecked. Journalists are cautious of using information of unknown origin and cannot be verified. From, from blogger Miss Indaivarona, young people are thirsty for knowledge. A higher accountability is expected from public officials. There's a need to vet information. PCOO at this time said that they have no definition yet or they're uh, cautious about defining fake news. A discussion on page verification in Facebook, takedown policy, hate speech in, ensued. F Facebook said that they are, there are efforts to renew, uh, to review posts and procedure. From Academe, Dr. Soriano of the LSU, she said that, I think this is the most important. Intents and motives should be determined should should be considered in the determination of fake news. So ano ba talagang intention sa paglabas ng balita? Ito ba'y para mang loko? Ito ba'y para manlin lang? Yun naman talagang basihan dahil pwede tayong lahat magkamali. Pero pag may mali siya at meron talagang intention na mang loko, yun talaga malinaw kung ano yung hindi makatotohanan. Salamat. Facebook committed that all information um, in the, the hearing should be utilized by them to correct practices, post monitoring, and others. And I thank you again for your presence here today. Maybe so that you won't have to travel back and forth. And I know that uh, Ms. DV have very young children. Maybe, maybe you can post somebody here and just come here every now and then to uh, enjoy our beaches instead, as opposed to shuttling back and forth just to answer questions. I mean, the Philippines is much more than uh, the Senate. There's a lot to offer in the country that is beautiful and you don't have to be here on an official basis all the time. Okay. Facebook in reply said that they have the capacity to, deper to determine uh, such, I guess, click farms that Mr. Nokum uh, mentioned. The committee will appreciate receiving reports on the matter for future and committee use. The chair requested that Facebook be represented in government forum fora where they are requested. To have an office of Facebook in the Philippines where you already have, but we just want a policy representative whom you will listen to <laughs> and not just for display. Okay? To address the concerns of Secretary Andanar in the Marawi Sor in Facebook, to help in addressing terrorism issue, FB committed to have a Facebook office in Manila. Well, you already have one. There are 30,000 fake news in France have been purged last year. Uh, Facebook said that they will do the same in the Philippines and will report on the matter. Facebook said that they have tools to foster transparency in the issue of political campaign spending. The National Bureau of Investigation sought the assistance of Facebook on the issue of libel and cyber libel concerns. Informasyon, tamang informasyon ang dapat na matutunan ng ating mga mamayan. Um, hindi news na minamanipula ng iilan para lamang masilbihan ang sarili nilang kapakanan. Alam ko marami sa atin sa gobyerno may tapat na hangarin na maglingkod. Pasensya na kung ako'y nagiging makata. Pero ang totoo po nito ay Siguro naman ng ating mga kababayan ay hindi tayo pagbibigyan ng malaking responsibilidad kung hindi naman malaki ang ekspektasyon nila sa atin. Hindi naman siguro masama 
na sabihin na mas maging stricto tayo sa ating sarili. Na nasa batas na nakalaan, na meron na talagang parusa sa mga nanlilinlang. Ano ba naman ang sabihin natin na sa mismong rangko natin sa gobyerno, tayo mismo ay maging um, responsable sa ating sarili at managot para sa ating sarili. Huwag natin ibahin ang ating prinsipyo dahil lamang tayo ay nabigyan ng ibang katungkulan. Sapagkat sa bandang huli, ang titingin rin sa ating muka, sa ating sarili, ay yung mga nagawa natin na nakalipas na hindi natin inayos ang ating trabaho. Um, the core principles of journalism, which is so easy, easily googled, is truth and accuracy, independence, fairness and impartiality, humanity, and accountability. I think those are truths or those are principles that we can all we can all use, whether in the private or in the public sector. And again, I'd like to thank Secretary Andanar for your presence here today. Sir, hindi naman masyadong madugo, di ba? Um, Attorney Banag, also, uh, thank you for being open to our office. When we have questions, we can easily approach you. Also, being a woman, I'm sure that helps. Uh, uh, representative, the representative from the KBP, sir, for always uh, supporting our hearings. From the mainstream media, thank you also um, for sharing with us your, 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 your guiding principles to be accountable to the public. Our bloggers na medyo matapang pa rin magpakita dito. Attorney Trixie, thank you. Uh, Globe Smart, uh, NBI, members of the Philippine Information Agency, at marami pang iba sa inyo. Maraming salamat po sa inyong pagdalo ngayong araw. Kung meron po kayong nais pang idagdag sa ating pag-uusap ngayon para masama sa ating uh, deliberasyon, please submit your position papers. Again, Facebook and Google, thank you for your presence here today. Please enjoy the Philippines. I hope you have more time for that. And please promote the Philippines in Facebook and Google because there's a lot um, in our country that other uh, citizens of the world can actually appreciate and, and enjoy. So with that, I, this meeting on, um, on the Committee on Public Information and Mass Media is there, therefore adjourned. Thank you.